All right, we're started. Let's have a seat and get started, please. Uh, I know we're all hoping to stay here till midnight, but we got to get started. Let's have a seat and get quiet, please. Fired up. <laughs> Welcome to the October 26, 2021, 6.30 p.m. City Council meeting. We do have a quorum, so I'll call this meeting to order. Would you please join me in a moment of silence? And the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Seems like we should have done that about an hour and 15 minutes ago. All right, City Clerk, would you please read the rules to speak? Yes, individuals wishing to speak on public and non-public hearing agenda items must complete a sign-up card prior to the item being introduced. Those wishing to speak on quasi-judicial public hearings must complete a sign-up card and sign the oath. Sign-up and oath cards are available on the table in the council chamber. Individuals wishing to speak on non-agenda items may do so under petitions from the public present. This opportunity is offered twice in the meeting. The individuals may speak at either the first or second petitions, but not both. No sign-up card is required. Citizens shall not comment on any issue more than once during the meeting. All comments except petitions and requests must address the pending issue, and citizens will be given three minutes to speak on all items. Citizens wishing to speak on the consent agenda must submit a comment card identifying the items of interest. Speakers shall be given three minutes per item. However, citizens wishing to speak on more than three consent agenda items shall be limited to speaking for a total of 10 minutes, regardless of the number of items identified. <clears throat> All sign-up cards and exhibits being submitted to the City Council shall be placed in the box on the table in the Council Chamber. Thank you very much. Do I have minutes to approve? I have no minutes to approve. Thank you very much. One moment. Turn the page. City Manager, special recognition, some presentations. Yes, sir, and uh, Council, before we begin, um, we have a late ad agenda item. Uh, it's for a grant agreement with the county to extend the grant for Save the Indian River Lagoon septic to, to a sewer conversion. And I would like to add that agenda item to 12C with your approval. And do I need to... Um Take a vote in cards on that? Yes, sir. Uh, you need to take a, a vote on that, a majority vote to add it to the agenda. And once it's added, we will take cards on that item. Once, After if, it's it, if it's added. Yes, sir. All right. Do I have a motion to add that? Mr. Yes, Mayor, I move that we approve an additional item called grant agreement for 12C. Second. I have a motion. I have a uh, from Member Jordan. I have a second from Vice Mayor. Uh, let's go roll call vote. Get started. Member Robinson. Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Do I have any cards on the addition? Yes. Yes. Okay, call the cards, please. Do we do it? Do we need to do this if right If you now? added, we will take cards on the actual agenda item because okay, that will so be the proposition Okay, so I don't need to take cards on, on that vote on adding it. Right. Now that you've added it, we will take cards on 12 oh, Okay. I thought there might be because we just voted on something. We need to do cards. Okay, good. We go back to the beginning. All right, city manager. On to uh, item 6A, which is the Historic Preservation Board. The terms of regular members, Ross Foster, Bert Gatkins, Alan Kissel, and Joseph Adams, and alternate member Tony Schifolo all expire on October 31st, 2021. Regulars members, regular members Foster, Gatkins, Kissel, Adams, and alternate member Schifolo have all expressed their willingness and desire to serve on this board and have requested a reappointment for another two-year term to expire on October 31st, 2023. There's currently one additional application on file for your consideration. Rhonda Harrell, non-resident, has expressed her willingness and desire to serve on this board and has requested appointment to a two-year term to expire on October 31st, 2023. Can we make a motion and vote on all four at one time, or do we need to do these one by one by one by one? Depends on the motion. It's I'm not required to do them singularly. If there's a motion for the four... This looks like a pretty mundane issue here that we could just simply move to bring them on. Uh, I'd like to um, see if somebody can make a motion 
word it in that way? Do we have cards? Do you want to? Oh, well, but I want to get the motion first. Okay. Mr. I, I Mayor, think, I Mayor, before you do that, you probably want to do cards. No, I'm going to go ahead and let's get oh, the motion. Okay. Uh, yes, and, and make sure we get it right with the all we one already time. We had that discussion. Yeah, we, yes, we did. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve regular members Rosalie Foster, um, William Gachins, Alan Kiesel, and Joseph Adams, and alternate member Tony Schiffalo um, to a two-year term to expire October 31st, 2023. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I would second that, um, but I do want to see if any of these people are present, and I have to say Rhonda Harrell who is a non-resident who um, submitted her application, seems like a great candidate. And I hope that she will stick around and, and let us consider appointing her at some point. And that's exactly why I'm doing it like I am, because now that we have the motion out there, we don't have a wonder, are they going to accept they're, they're there? But I would like for, first of all, uh, anyone who is here and would like to say something, if you're one of those we just nominated, feel free to come up and uh, give us a word. Hey, how are you? Very good. Thank you. My name is Joseph Adams. I'm up for reappointment to the Historic Preservation Board, and it's been an honor to serve. I have, was one of the founding members of the Historic Preservation Board. And oh, I'm very now. good. I didn't know that. And I now hold the office of secretary for the board. Now, the board's made up of various people with various talents. And it's an honor to serve with them because we have people from all walks of life and different talents. Alan Kiesel, you know, who is our chairman, is an architect. Um, uh, anyway. Um, and he's one of the ones that's up for reappointment. But the board couldn't do the work we do without the help of planning. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim Ford is our primary contact. And then we have Brad Parrish, who helps us out a lot. And then finally, one of the more important people, Lori, who is our uh, secretary and the contact to make sure we can come to our meetings. Now, the board's done a lot. And, you know, while I've been there, we've done workshops. In fact, we just had a workshop. 17 people attended. And the 17 people who attended were probably the 17 people we really wanted to attend. Uh, and then, of course, we had a presentation. From a very tired council member. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we brought in a lady from uh, uh, Sarasota who also gave a presentation. It was quite interesting. Uh, other than workshops, we also have been working on local designations. We now have 12 local designations. The sad news is one of those designations, the Gibson River House, we will probably lose. And when I say lose, I mean it will be gone forever. Hmm. Um, the gentleman who brought it forward, he was hoping for the best. And as they dug into the project, it hasn't looked that good. And it's one of those things. Now, the Carter House, which where the Boys and Girls Club is going and uh, Northwood Heart Charities has stepped up for, that's a win. It's a great adaptive reuse. And that was what you presented. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we, helped us, we helped Titus Little become a, uh, a certified local government. We review national register nominations because of our position. We look at state uh, registered uh, uh, nominations. And in fact, we had to look at a, uh, a cell tower that's going up to make sure it didn't harm the historic areas of Titusville. And then our crowning achievement. Well, we've always been publicizing Titusville's historic areas. This is our previous brochure, but our crowning Before you get interrupted, did you just did it. How much more time do you need to give us the summary here? Just one second. I'm going to. Okay, okay. then sorry, we'll, just hold, we'll, we'll hold the clock and let him go. Yeah. Um, the, we just finished, we wrote, we write grants, and we just finished a grant to do historic Titusville. It's a booklet. Got that. We've got a brochure that tells you that it's not only a booklet, but it's also a website and a phone app. And if you haven't typed into this, 
you've made a big mistake because this is a great opportunity to see Titusville and the history of this area. And I thank you for Thank you time. for I'm being on the board. No, you didn't. And thank you for being passionate about being on the board. Thank you. I know where you, you, you live. You live in a very special and historic home. Hi, I'm Tony Cifolo, proud owner of the locally designated historic Norwood House, 715 Tropic Street. We're included on the tour. And I am a happy resident in the city of Titusville. I've come before you many times these past years, sometimes adversarially, many times full of praise, the people's podium, right. the recent tree ordinance, thank you very much. I'm often emotional, but I'm always passionately presenting the best interests of my fellow citizens. Tonight, I'm here to request my reappointment to the Historic Preservation Board. I've served two years as an alternate, missing only one meeting. I've more times than not gotten to sit up here on the dais and um, as a voting member making a quorum. Either way, the board has always tolerated, permitted, and accepted my opinions and advice. In my tenure, we've accomplished a lot that adds value both monetarily and in goodwill to the city. We've acted on the historic designations of the mid-century modern imperial towers, now known as the Dream Space Coast Apartments. And we have plans to research other examples of mid-century modern here in Titusville. We approved the demolition and shaped the rebuilding of the Mutter Building at 346 Washington in the downtown historic district. We made decisions concerning the adaptive reuses of the Carter House, now a boys and girls club. We guided the development of the, of the um, Explore Historic Titusville tours and website. And I worked closely with the consultants to shape the tours. That's why the Norwood and Carter House are on the tour. An ongoing project is the formation of a neighborhood conservation district in West Titusville to research, document, mark, and preserve the historic nature of that now mixed, but once the heart of the African American business district and neighborhoods. I would like to continue on the Historic Preservation Board in order to see this project to completion, especially since the Norwood House is in this district. I helped to shape and actively participated in our recent neighborhood Revitalization through Historic Preservation Community Workshop, at which Vice Mayor um, made a presentation. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity I've had for the past two years to serve on this board, and I'm very happy to be reappointed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your passion and commitment. <laughs> Any other speakers who are uh, appointees? Any cards? Okay, so we can move forward on the appointment of four regular members and one alternate to the Historic Preservation Board. I have a motion and I have a second. Are we solid on that? All right, roll call vote. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you guys very much. Uh, it's clear that you're not just members of a board. You, you're a family. I appreciate that. Uh, city manager on to uh, item 6b, which is the North Brevard Library District Board appoint one regular member to the North Brevard Library District Board with a term to expire on September 30th, 2023. Miss Joyce R Romero has expressed her willingness and desire to serve on this board as the city council appointee. Currently, there are no other applications on file for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, council, any comments? Any cards? Is the person here? Yes. Come, uh, come on up if you wish. And you don't have to give us a long speech or anything, but it, just give us a little <laughs> little talk about... Uh, Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I am not prepared for a speech. I don't have the background in terms of the uh, service for the community yet, but I am eager to be a part, and this is my first one. So I am excited to initiate programs for the library and any other um, volunteer programs in general. But uh, for now, I just wanted to focus on that library part of it. And it's a pleasure to see everybody. Thank you. And what I see right now is a lot of enthusiasm. I'm excited, so, I know. <laughs> so I'm excited about that too. Thank you so much for being here. Oh All right, do I have a motion? 
Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve Ms. Ma Joyce Romero to the North Bar Library District Board with a term to expire on September 30th, 2023. And a big second. I have, I have a uh, motion from Member Jordan, a uh, second from Vice Mayor, and we're looking for an enthusiastic roll call vote. <laughs> Mayor, Mayor Diesel. Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson. Yay. Member Stokel. Yes. Member Robinson. Yahoo! Member George. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> you won't get that from Member Robinson again. <laughs> uh, that's everybody, right? You passes mm -hmm. unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank I look you. forward to seeing the enthusiasm you bring everywhere you go. Okay. City Manager. Uh, on to 6C, which is the uh, Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization Citizens Advisory Committee. Regular member David Carter has requested a resignation effective October 11th, 2021, and there are no applications on file. I think this is from the vote. I got a lot of names up here right now, and I don't think you all are interested. Okay, so let's oh. go with um, council. All right, now they're gone. Um, are there any cards? Yes, sir. Stan Johnson. Okay. <clears throat> Stan Johnston. I'm a registered professional engineer. Gosh, you already knew that. And uh, I've been to uh, uh, one of these meetings, or maybe more than that. And I'm reading the newspaper, and, and the city of Titusville is planning to do some things like a bunch of high-rise buildings and so forth like this. And uh, we've this uh, US-1 and, uh, and our arterials, uh, uh, they're getting pretty busy already. Uh, I was here before uh, Garden Street was... Uh, was uh, four laned. Uh, I was here when uh, a number of streets were were, um, were enlarged. I've been here for 50 years, and this TPO is important. Just recently, uh, we had an issue is that we're talking about in the TPO. We're talking about rising sea levels, and it maybe doesn't seem like it means much much here. Saint Augustine does make make a difference. I called them up and talked to them about it. They are affected by it, and. Uh, uh, and according to the TPO, we are going to be affected by it too. So whatever you do oh, on this is that whoever's going to be on the TPO, they need to pay attention to what's going on in Titusville because we are, we are booming with this uh, high rise and stuff, which turning us into little Miami. What's it going to do to our traffic? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. Um, do I have a motion? Say again. Move to accept the resignation of regular member David Carter. Hey. I have a motion and I need a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Passes unanimously. Now we move to petitions and requests from the public. For the uh, record, my name is Dwight Severs. My wife, Lori, uh, is here with me uh, before the clock starts. As you know, I submitted a video to the city to request that it be played. I was advised officially that uh, it was not in a form format that the city would be able to use on the broadcast system. So, unfortunately, I cannot ask them to show it because I've been advised it's not a proper format. I think I know the real reason why I received that answer. In any event, I've handed out to you uh, some material that I'll go over. Uh, this is a very serious matter with regard to our wife, my wife and me, and quite concerned about it. So uh, the first page. I was going to say, for the record, I know that I've seen the video. Yes, I sent it to all of you. Okay. I, I thought it would be appropriate okay. to illustrate the point to the, Perfect. To the audience. Thank you. What's going on? But in any event, the first page illustrates where we're talking about. And this is a city utility location map. There's a couple of manholes there. The westerly manhole was the one that was uh, pumped out. And uh, the line of Gray Street apparently was cleaned. You know where Riverside Drive, a fire hydrant, etc., was. 
The first picture you will see is a photo I took on September the 22nd at 7.25 a.m. I, I know the exact time and place because my I-11 phone tells me and records it, so I know exactly uh, when it was. Uh, this was a back truck that was dumping into the, uh, the gutter there in the inlet in front of the lift station. Uh, I took photographs. I have multiple photographs of the water that went down the gutter, etc. So I know it occurred. What exactly the vac track dumped at that time, I have no idea. But it dumped it directly and it went out the outfall 30 feet away, right into the river, and it was coming right down towards our house. We don't think much of that. In any event, per the contract, I don't know whether this is a proof dump site because the dump sites have to be approved, that the city approved this as a dump site. But it occurred, and I'm aware that it's occurred on more than one occasion uh, as such. In researching, I found that the city has a contract with Hinterland for three years, $150,000 per year, primarily to rehabilitate stormwater pipes with cured-in pipeline. I have no objection, certainly, to rehabilitating as such. On October 14th, I received a video that was posted at the Indian River Lagoon Discussion Group page. That's the one I sent to you. It describes some brown reddish discharge coming from the storm sewer, the same storm sewer, down in front of our house. The video shows our home, our dock, and a plume of nasty brown reddish water moving along the shoreline to about 50 feet to 100 feet in front of our property. The person talking in the video is a local fishing guide as such. And I will play, since we're not allowed to show it. Well, I thought I would just play it for you. Stop the clock, please. No, 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 no. I was, just, I was getting ready to beep, and I didn't want to beep while you were talking. So keep going. Okay. That squeaking sound in the background is our lift station, and it makes a lot of noise. It's been doing so for the last several months. All right, now that we're about to run out of your time, how much time do you need to finish? I need at least three minutes. Um, can I get a motion? I'd like to pre complete my presentation if I could. Can I get a motion on three minutes? So moved. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? I didn't get a vote from some people. Do we need a roll call vote? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm having a concern. Um, because you text this to us, the video to us, yes. and I sent you something, yes. and apparently you don't agree with it. Yes. And, well, I, I just don't understand because the, the report is pretty clear of what's going on, and I certainly am in agreement. Since you sent the video to us, I don't think it would have been appropriate to, to uh, show that to the public when, in my opinion, and as I told you, I'm in agreement with the report that things were fine. There was nothing wrong. We sent an inspector there. There was nothing wrong. So to speak about that, you, you may not like what when you did saw. you send um, an inspector there? I'm, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. What, what you may not like is the, the results of what the inspection was, but there was a member of staff that went to that site, investigated, and it came back with a report in which your husband got so I, that, that is my concern. I, I just don't want us to be going down a rabbit hole when it's not necessary. You have a perfect right to ex say that I disagree with the report, but you came up with something you said that you didn't feel was correct. We investigated. It turned out that everything was on the up and up. So that just to keep pushing it, just because you don't like the answer, is not, in my mind, No, appropriate. I don't like the answer. I'd like to know when those people came. Well, Did first, they come Thursday when the stuff was I, I think, pouring out? I think we need to I, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. more time. Here, here's where, here's where, <laughs> where, where I am. I wanted to give the finish the presentation, and a lot of a lot of what you said is where I would come from. 
but I wanted to finish the presentation um, just so we finish the presentation. So I would, you know, I think it's up for a vote right now. So let's go roll call vote. Yes and no. Oh, you want to vote again? I want a roll call vote. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? No. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Please extend the time three minutes for the completion of the presentation. Go. I just would like to point out what was addressed in the report is the tip of the iceberg. For example, I just pointed out to uh, an event that occurred was that was not addressed and the dumping into the lift station or in, into the river on this specific day, time and place. That wasn't addressed. So you, you're not looking at the whole picture. In addition, uh, I'd like to point out that on the same date, October 14th, my wife came home, saw the, this truck there on Gray Street at the uh, manhole at the intersection of Indian River Avenue and Gray Street. After seeing the video, I went outside and looked as to what was going on. And the second picture I've given you shows a volume of discharge, a photo I took at 616 on October the 14th, and there was a large volume of water coming out at that time, and the water was dark, had lots of what would appear to me to be pollutants in it. That's at 616, long after the guide left at 215, the same day. In addition, I took a photograph of the truck that was there at 620, and he had his hose attached to the fire hydrant, and they were just pouring water out of the fire hydrant into this hole, the manhole, as such, which, and it was being discharged out into the Indian River, and all that pollutants was going out in the river right in front of our house. So, photograph number four is a photo showing what the normal discharge is. I'd like to quickly just turn to the contract itself. And I've given you the, uh, an attachment. Contractors shall remove all sludge, dirt, sand, rocks, grease, etc. at the downstream manhole of the section that's being cleaned. They never came to the downhole man, downstream, uh, downstream man, manhole to clean this section of the pipe. All they did is flushed out the pipe into the river. That's what they did. I saw it with my own eyes. And Mr. Jordan, you may not believe me, but that's what occurred. And this is not right. We are spending a lot of money trying to, millions of dollars pumping silt, contaminants, and muck out of the river, and Titusville is pumping it into the river. Amen. That's wrong. That's simply wrong. All right, now, now the time is up. And as I said, I had a couple questions. One of them is when you have this concern, clearly a concern to you, and you have these assumptions, because at one point you said you didn't know what it was was going into the water, and then you used the word pollutant. So if you don't know what it is, you don't really know that it's a pollutant. I'm not questioning it. I didn't see it, and I'm certainly not the guy to answer all those questions. But my question is, when that happened, and you saw that, and you taped that, did you talk to anybody with staff to find out what was going on? I texted you, and I didn't get an answer on that, because that would be my first thing to anybody. Did you well, go to find out what was going on? Mr. Diesel, I didn't follow my wife's advice. That's she always a mistake. She wanted me to contact the city, but I was giving the city the benefit of the doubt. And I made a mistake because here they are. That was September 22nd. Here they are on October 14th doing all this dumping. I made a mistake. And they were there again today. And, and I don't really know all of that because really and truly when you come to us, we're not there every day. And to get a real answer, you'd have to go speak with staff, and, and, and I may see if they have any input at this time. But I texted you as soon as I got it. My first thought was, I wonder what that is. It's interesting. 
I'm not sure. It could be bad. Might not. Mary. And then I thought, well, you being you and me knowing you forever, I thought, well, did you ask them? Because I'd like to hear what they said to you. Did they get back to you? So that was my question to you. Okay. Uh, thankful to Mr. Jordan. He sent me a copy of the one report. No, I did not contact them. And frank, I'll be frank with you. I have found contacting many staff members is a waste of my time. So I'm coming directly to you because you are the ones that can hold them accountable. I have found violations of agreements, pointed at them out to the city, and they do nothing about it. Okay, so well, that, I'm coming to you as the elected representative to do something about it. Well, and I get that, and that's, that sounds really good, but I don't know what I'm doing with that. I need to know what the staff would tell me, and I need to know what the staff told you, but since you didn't talk to them, they didn't tell you anything. With that being said, Member Stokel. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of my frustration a little bit, too, because science is not my strong area. However, I will tell you, I've taken many tours with Public Works. I'm trying to learn as much as I can, and I think all of us care about the water issues that we see we definitely see my concern is the time stamping as well because i just heard all about this yesterday and then i see pictures from september 22nd october 14th and i'm like that would have been helpful if you don't feel like staff is responding you you have our email addresses i know i've talked to you numerous of times like if there's something if there's something with one of our contractors that our staff doesn't know about like i would like as much information as possible in this role as a council member to learn more and to do what I can, but I'm very limited now when I see a couple weeks ago this happened and I don't know what I can do about it other than, you know, when I was notified of this, we sent somebody out there, we have a report. I'm not sure what more I guess I can do or what you would like council to do. I, I'm glad you came here, but it's, it's in the moments if we see something going on, like I would, we can talk to staff we can't if staff doesn't know but like if we don't know at that time there's really limited on what we can do and it's okay. it's very frustrating i feel like for me in this role because i'm really trying and i don't know what more i guess i can do well i i think a very the number one question is has this site been designated as a dumping site to dump dump out your back truck the contract says there's have to be pre-approved by the city no, I don't know the answer to that question, but my neighbor tells me they've been there at least twice dumping. That's wrong. I don't know what was in the vac truck, but it cannot be good. Even if it's hydrant water, you shouldn't be dumping chlorinated hydrant water into the river. You shouldn't be doing that. And the only thing I know to do, and I think the member Stokel said, and I said it earlier, is pursue with staff, and, and, and it seemed to be an explanation that came our way as soon as they got it, but that, I mean, I would like to talk to them more, but again, I would like to, what I would like to have heard is, yeah, I went to staff, and this is who I talked to, and this is what they said, and then I would know where to go to say, what did you say, and why did you say it, and show me that that's how it's supposed Mr. to be. Mr. Mayor, I would be happy to sit down with you and the staff. I'd be happy to do that. I, I'd love to know the answer to some of these questions as well let me because move on here. i don't want to be a dumping ground i, I would say this back trucks I, if there was some contractor issue that went wrong we need to take care of that i do not believe that there's anybody in the city that thinks it's a good idea to do something into the river that's not productive i just don't believe that's the case vice mayor and i guess I'm, i sort of share their frustration because i'm like you and I know that if we have a staff member there who goes, ha, and catches them in the act, it would be, it's, it's easy to prove. You know, the contractor screwed up, the contractor needs to be held responsible. Um, knowing that this is an issue, I think it probably behoove uh, the staff to keep an eye on them. And the next time they're down there, sort of watch out and see, see who's doing what. They were there today. They'll be on back. Dry Street. They'll be back. <laughs> so someone from the city should be there watching what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, Member Jordan. Well, first, I, and I need you to look at me when I say that. I never said I didn't believe you. 
So I, I'm not saying that you're lying or anything like that. All I'm saying is that you sent us uh, the video. The first thing I did, because I wanted to find my text that I sent to the city manager, I said, so what is happening here? We need to have an answer, I'm sure. So you got the reaction, I believe, that you were looking for the person who's representing you. But in my mind, it certainly would have been easier if you had called somebody out at that point where you saw something so it well, could be rectified. I, I didn't I, take my wife's advice. Yeah, you, you need to continue. To, you need to think about that because, I mean, no, it, it's all about. I to tell you a few things. The, the yeah. second time it happened, it was after hours. So is there a, a way to contact the city after hey, hours? Honestly, you could have just contacted us and we could have contacted the city manager. All, all I'm saying is, well, first of all, I, I just don't want us, you know, to be airing dirty laundry and all this good stuff. If there's a problem, the last thing we want is to dirty the Indian River any more than what it is. I mean, it's already messed up. And when you showed, the, you sent us that video and I saw the stuff coming out, of course I was concerned. But, of course, I'm going directly to the city manager and saying, okay, what's going on here? Because I got a video. But then you tell me tonight that what we got as a report had nothing to do with September. Well, you gave us the video yesterday. I mean, I don't know how we we're supposed to react to it, except the way we reacted to it by trying to find out from staff what was going on. I mean, isn't that reasonable? Wouldn't you think that's reasonable? I certainly agree that's reasonable, and yeah. I would hope you would have some questions of staff and ask them for a report. I'll be glad to participate in any discussion about it. Yeah, we don't need to do that. I think that. there's something <laughs> clearly wrong, and I don't think yeah. they should be dumping all of this stuff in the river. Okay. And I don't think hundreds or thousands of gallons of fire hydrant water, treated water, should be dumped in. They could have simply set up their vac truck at the in, at the, in front of the Gray Street lift station, as the contract says, and pump the stuff out. They didn't do that. Okay, but this is summation on your part of what they didn't do. All you saw is what you saw, right? So right in front of our house. <laughs> I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm just saying you, you have come to a conclusion based on what you felt was wrong. And there may be a very good explanation of exactly what you saw, but just to say they were totally wrong about this thing to me just doesn't make it. I, a reasonable well, person can't do that. I, there is a ch there's a challenge there. We want to fix it if there's a problem for sure. So I think we've heard it. City managers has heard it. We're I guarantee you this is not going to just stop right here because you have said something. There's a video. We've gotten a report, and, and we'll go from there. But honestly, I think in the future, and you've said it, which really hurts me. You're saying you, you go to staff, and frankly, you don't think that they – I'm going to give you the truth. But if you would like to sit down and discuss some of that, I'll be glad to. No, I, I don't want to do that because, okay. you know, <laughs> that's the last hour. I mean, because it's always, always going to be a, a one-sided thing. What we need to do is to go forward. There is a challenge here and have the st city staff take care of this and report back to, to, to the, um, the citizens who made this, this claim. That's what I think we should do. No, no, you can't, no, you can't interject. No. You can't interject. It might be funny and everything else, but <laughs> we, we can't do that. that. Member Robinson. Yeah, <clears throat> we're living in a time that there is no privacy because we can video and snap everything. And all I would ask, and that we look like we're behind the eight ball, uh, I was very concerned about what you uh, shared with me. Uh, we can. We had a, a report based on the city's reaction to what you had shown. We had that report. You see what they do, and my uh, direction as we go forward, as any member of the city, any resident of the city of Titusville that sees anything out of order, out of order they need to report it immediately. It is better for us to respond as close to the time that it happened and try to get answers. I have no problem texting the, or emailing the city manager. He always responds and, and, and try to find answers. 
And if, uh, if we find that we can't get answers from you immediately or try to get it stopped, then that uh, we are doing something wrong. If someone is breaking the law, that's why we have law enforcement officers, fire department to go down and monitor the situation as well. But to try to get in a point that I got your situation is, is, is that I see that happening here a lot. Uh, and I'm saying that this is one, but there is I got you situation going on. So let us try to work together to make our, uh, our city, Indian River Lagoon, as best as it can. I would have been hysterical. I'm a, I'm a sailor. And when you put stuff in the water that doesn't look the same color as water, I get very upset. But to for the dates of when this happened and the date that when we find out about it, it's a whole it's a long time between those dates. I find even though it gets on my nerves, I find out a lot that when my wife tells me something, <laughs> if I follow it. I normally come out on uh, on top. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if I said that right. I mean, I, honestly, I didn't. Uh, I thought that the incident was a freak incident and right. didn't occur again. And guess what happened? Okay. Uh, so let let, let us uh, let us not uh, go over the, uh, too long a debate on this, and we're going to try to get as many answers and directions and clean up. And if uh, uh, we got members of the city, residents of this city, monitoring that situation and monitoring every, uh, for the city council to work in my short time here, you, the city, the members of the city, has to be our, by our eyes and our ears as to what's going on out in the community. And once it gets to us, if we don't respond, you need to just fire us. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll just conclude, and we've been through this, but again, I did text you back. Yes, sir, you did. And I did text you with, did you, were, you know, talk to staff? Because I wanted to know what staff said. Because I kind of thought you were going to say, yes, I did. Here's who I talked to, and this is what they said. I could then pursue that. But I think it needs to be pointed out, um, you know, again, no one on this council, we, we spend way too much time, effort, care, you know, I, I walk that river every single morning, and it, it's sad. The word manatee is very sad to me right now. So that's a big deal to me, and it's a big deal to all of them, and it's a big deal to them. So for something like that to happen doesn't benefit anybody. It's not like somebody said, let's go mess a river up today from the city's point of view. If a contractor is doing that and they don't know it, we need to get on that. But, again, we need to know it before we can fix it. And, uh, you know, kind of like if someone broke into your house and you didn't call the police and then you came to city council two weeks later and said, hey, this happened in my house and you, know, you guys need to take care of this. Well, no, we're not the first line of defense. The first line is who is responsible over there? Because, you know, and depending on what it was, it might vary. And then we can go to them and say, what did we do? How, and I, I do that and we do that. What did we do to fix that? How did that happen? Right now, I just got a video kind of late yesterday. Um, and as soon as I got it, I replied. And I'll leave it at that. I, I more than appreciate your concern. I hope you know that. Yes, um, um, and I just want to make sure we have a, a, a step to, to be on top of it and to fix it. And I will say this. It wasn't very long after I got the uh, video from you, there was an email from city manager who apparently got the video. I think it was city manager. It was from staff uh, speaking to the, the steps that were being taken or what had happened and an explanation. So I was pleased by that. Uh, Council, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Stan, your time's up. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. All right, I'm going to first start on is this. I don't listen to what my wife says. So I'm different well, than that's, Mr. That's Sievers. Great. There we but, go. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I don't tell her to call City Hall. That's for sure. Because um, uh, we, we have to live in the same... Uh, bedroom at times. So, so uh, uh, I'm here uh, uh, to tell you that you're doing things wrong and that you're not being honest. And uh, I've given you this uh, 
uh, this sent this to you, and and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Larice and so forth. He has he has this uh, uh, one of these things, which is black and white, and his is black and white. And you saw him before. I gave him before him before. He just tore it up and put it in the wastebasket because it's upsetting. And and the thing is, it, of course, it's upsetting. Uh, and the thing is, I've been doing what Mr. Robinson did. Said he said when you when you see something happen, report it immediately. That's what I did. Let me see. For example, this thing right here, uh, that was reported immediately by Laura Lee Thompson. She she she, she said, I right, turn this. It's, uh, it didn't turn off. And we're talking about about December the seventeenth or something like that. You know, I reported it. Uh, didn't do it. It didn't do it. Do it. I report. I put his sign up. Still didn't do it. Still didn't do it. Just kept those films. Kept spraying the public with piss and poop. And, and so I put the sign up. I come to council meetings. I show them the sign. They still don't do it. They still don't do it. They do it for months. For months. I keep, they keep spraying piss and poop on the public. What is this? What are we going to do? I can't get, I mean, I come to you guys. I say, just stop it. And you don't do it. So here's another example right here. I come to, come to this, is, this is what was going on. Sewage is going to the river. Sewage is going to the river. And what I do is I even I, I contact the city immediately. I say, here it is. They see it. The contractor sees it. City sees it and so forth. They know they don't know about it. So I even put signing and seal it on, on December. I, I uh, email December 20th. I contact the city and then I sign and seal it December 22nd. Stop doing it. The city doesn't do it. They keep. And then what they do is that is that. On, on, this, on January the 12th, the city admits what we did. We, uh, Sean Stauffer said we, he, he went ahead and put sewage into the river because he was going to save the intersection. So then what, what do we do? He denies it. Consent order. 0113. Says the city stopped putting sewage into the river December the 19th. Lied by him, Mr. Stauffer. Lies by city attorney. And lies by Mr. Stauffer and city attorney. Oh, what is it? City manager, city attorney, and Mr. Stauffer. Lies, lies, more, more lies. What is the city going to do? I mean, we've got public here. Time's up. I'd, I'd like some more time. You gave him more time. I see no motion. We're good. Oh, Thank no, you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, God bless you. My name is Joyous Parrish. Uh, I live at 1136 Riverside Drive, Titusville. I've been out of the city for eight months uh, attending to some personal matters that made my being here uh, impossible. I'm here tonight not to rag on you. I just want to educate you a little bit so that you have some things to think about. Last year, 593 manatee were documented dead. This year, and it's not even a full year yet, 959 manatee documented dead. Since 2009, approximately 58% of the seagrass in the Indian River has been lost. The state has a plan to clean up the Indian River that you all are all aware of, but you have until 2035, if I'm not mistaken, to put into effect all of the provisions that might save the river. We can't last till 2035. The symptoms of our ecological problem are putting our entire coastal areas at risk, and the manatee is just the biggest symbol of that risk because it's the most visible. We're getting ready to have our high season of visitors. In my uh, parents' day, they used to call them the snowbirds are coming. Well, the last thing they enjoy seeing is bloated manatee carcasses. The $8 million that the state appropriated is grossly inadequate to do any good. We all know that. I'm not asking you to fix this problem overnight. I'm not 
crazy. I think everybody would, if they could, save a manatee. What I am asking you, though, is to take the steps necessary to make sure that the only thing that goes in the river is rainwater. We have to devise a system that quits putting pollutants in the river. It's, it's, it's that simple. And we can't wait till 2035 to do it. Every time these pollutants go, they kill more and more of the environment. All of the infrastructure of the river, so to speak, our crabs, our manatee. You can't eat the redfish that are growing. I, we're catching redfish, folks, but you can't eat them. We're catching drum, but you can't eat them. That's not a good thing. Amen. So that's all I wanted to ask you to please make this a priority, cleaning the river. Thank you. Thank you for your words. All right. So, not to beat a dead manatee to death, Lorley Thompson, 3550 Thank Irwin you. Avenue. And I have the staff report, you know. This is probably what, what got sent to um, Dwight. And it, and it says, the, the last sentence says, um, says, since Public Works was not notified at the time of the video, the discoloration was not observed in person. The water flowing out of the pipe in the video appeared to be mostly clear. It's likely that the discoloration was due to the water in the stormwater pipes being tannic along with sediment from the stormwater pipe and sediment on the bottom of the lagoon being disturbed. Tannic water is due to decomposing leaves, yard debris, and mulch within the water, and it causes the water to turn a reddish orange or tea-like color. Tannins are very common in the Indian River Lagoon and in stormwater discharges. Well, not really. I mean, tannins are not common in the Indian River Lagoon unless it rains and our stormwater and ditches dump into the lagoon. It's not a natural thing, only if it had come out of a natural um, thing like Turnbull Creek or Flounder Creek, then it's natural. But coming out of ditches and coming out of stormwater and coming out of stormwater pipes, it's not natural. And all that fresh water is not natural. We've changed the salinity of the river over time. And so emptying a fire hydrant into the river is not natural either. We got to quit putting so much fresh water in the river. And if you listen to the guide, if you could have heard him over the screeching of the gears in the worn out lift station, you would have heard him say Titusville again. That's the perception that the rest of the county has of Titusville. And you can't blame them. You drive on the US-1 and look at the stormwater pond in, in, in Sandpoint Park, and you see plants that look like they came out of a science fiction movie because they grew so fast when they put the bee mats in because there's so much nutrients. I'm not going to say what Stan calls it, but there's a lot of nutrients in the water. In those, in those ponds, and you look at the duckweed, and, and that's because there's too many nutrients in the pond. Well, guess where the water in those ponds is going? It's going in the lagoon. This is the only area in the state where manatees died of starvation. I got that right from Eric Sutton's mouth, the head of FWC. Manatees did not starve to death in other parts of the state. This is the only place they starved to death. This is the only place in the state where all of the seagrass is gone, and, and it's because what goes in the water in the north end of the, of, the, of the lagoon stays in the water. It can't move. So if this is not one of Stan's 21 atrocities, it needs to be number 22. Thank you. Amen. Anybody else for petitions or requests? Good evening, late evening. Good evening. Susan Palma, 1118 Riverside Drive. Um, I understand that as a resident and citizen of Titusville, we have our responsibility to do our due diligence and to help you and to give you good information. Um, this is all new to me. I, I live along the river. I've not seen a stick of grass underneath my dock in over five years, and it was lush when I first moved in. But I do have a question after tonight's meeting. 
did I hear a commitment from you, the count, the, 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 the council staff, this, the city staff, to further this? Was there a commitment to investigate this? Or I didn't hear any sort of response that was understandable to me that you were listening and other than us do a better job of reporting to you. Were you going to look further into this? Uh, and I don't think um, I'm looking at the word investigate. First of all, and let me let me finish. Go ahead and stop her clock. Um, when I got a video late yesterday afternoon, first I heard of it, and I replied back to the video, the the text. Did you ask staff? Did you go to staff? I mean, this isn't something we deal with. So when he didn't go to staff, I didn't find that out until I guess today. Um, I, would I talk to staff? Sure, I will. But I haven't had it 24 hours. Um, so absolutely. Now, I'm not going to use the word investigate. I don't want you guys to feel like you're under investigation over there. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. That's what I do. I can't say what they do. But I have no problem getting on the phone, getting on the text, coming to the office, saying, what's this all about? Because um, I, I don't understand it right now. I don't have enough because I haven't got feedback from the staff because they haven't been asked the right questions yet. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't think I have to put my hand on the Bible and swear. Well, I do, I do my job, and I'm going to go find out. Thank you. I, I understand communication timing, and, and you know, it's, it's been, you know, rolling along rather quickly. Communication is key. I know the Seavers um, has, have offered to sit down and, and talk to you and with you. And I'm, sure, I'm sure any one of us would um, if you reached out to us. Um, one other question is after hours, I walk very early with my dog and, you know, after hours, the city's closed. Who do we call? You say, call somebody. Do we we, we call have police? an after hours number. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I, and I would say only because, um, I've known Dwight for, again, since the eighties, we coached little league together. So we go way back. He's got my phone number. He's got my text and really and truly. I probably prefer a text rather than a ringing phone at 11 o'clock or something. But, uh, you know, one of those, hey, um, this, that, or the other, that's, that's just step one. And several people do. Um, but there is an after hours number that at least I'm sure if it's nobody's there, I'm not sure how that works out, but they get to it quick. It, it, it's staffed. So, I, and again, I got to say it sometimes when people stand up there in this case, it's like, you know, I got in my truck and I took a bunch of stuff and I put it in the river. I, you know, we don't do that. I mean, that makes no sense on any any kind of way. And then when you're talking about you haven't seen any seagrass or whatever in five, six, seven years, whatever, I will have to say, and that's not to say we're not working hard. And the most important thing for me, if I could do anything when I got out of the seat, is that, boy, the river looks a whole lot better or the river's doing a whole lot better. That's important to me. But six years ago, five years ago, none of us were up here. And when I ran, that was the same year we had the Indian River Lagoon uh, half-cent sales tax on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So rest assured, this problem, as I've heard Stan say many times, has gone back decades and more. So we're trying to fix uh, uh, an issue that we didn't go out there and, and start messing up. But that doesn't mean we want to make it worse. We want to make it better. I just heard something uh, from Laura Lee concerning, uh, oh, I think she's left me. She does that to me. Oh, there she goes. She switched seats on me um, about BMAPs. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you even almost said it angrily. Well, talk to me because I'm really interested. I, I thought those were a wonderful thing. And now you're telling me maybe they're not. So I, I don't know all these things. I think sometimes when you run for mayor or whatever it is you run for, everybody thinks, oh, they know everything. I don't know that stuff. I'm trying to learn that stuff. And I've, I've had many meetings with her. I've had many meetings with Kay. I've had many meetings with anybody that can teach me something. Matter of fact, I just came, as they can testify, from the two-day uh, uh, LID seminar down in Rockledge. Um, not because I was a speaker. I was a listener. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to learn up here what we can do. And again, I need to hear some more about beam maps because I was bragging on those for two years. So we'll see what happened with that. So uh, can start the clock and you got two more minutes if you're continuing. Just please, if you open up dialogue, I and I'm sure a lot of other people would be happy to be part of it. And, and that is the beginning of the solution is dialogue, dialogue between all the parties involved. And I appreciate your work. And I want to help you. And we will be more vigilant. OK? Thank help. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Next speaker. <laughs> Stan? 
<laughs> All right, uh, city manager, we're ready to move on. On to consent. Uh, council, do you have any questions of staff on consent items A through Q? It's going on 9 o'clock. We're going to have less. Yeah. I, I don't oh, want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't want to pull it, but I was wondering if Sean could just explain item L just so I can be more aware of what that money is being used for. That's the only one I have. Well, let me go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll just add a little bit more uh, to this. Uh, we've been uh, working on this project now for the past couple of years. We did a uh, preliminary design study um, about a year or two ago and the goal of that study is to get us the city at the morning of water treatment plant to four log treatment and to give you a numerical representation what that means is that it's um, uh, reduction or cleaning capacity will be 99.99 percent uh, effective that's that's what four log means and so really and that is that that is the gold standard for groundwater treatment um, it, when here we there's a handful of things that we're going to improve um, we're gonna have new ground storage tank fill lines we're also going to replace the um, we have gaseous uh, anhydrous ammonia on site uh, which there is some risk to that we're going to turn turn that over to a liquid system and so we're real I know our um, certainly our operators are very happy that we're going to make that change because it takes a you know a little bit of hazard out of the plant um, we're also going to add new chemical addition points as well as um, new chemical addition um, pumps and skids. And so with these, and, and I won't go into all the details about the, how it changes it, but it will definitely improve by, by 100 um, the treatment that we're able to do at the Morning Dove plant. Okay, so just to clarify, this is helping our groundwater before it gets treated for drinking water to be more clean prior Yes, this is this is our treatment process where we take the groundwater okay. and and that treatment process at the morning dove is what's going to be enhanced. Okay, is it going to include more testing or more frequent testing, better testing? No, um, this is all about where we put the chemicals um, in the process to be more effective and additional piping uh, that will go into the yard to allow more time for more contact time between the chemicals and the raw water to improve their effectiveness. Will we still need to do chlorine dosing? Um, th uh, that, that we'll have to see. Um, that's probably likely. Uh, we will have a more stable product coming out of the plant, but the chlorine dosing is more related to the effects of the distribution system and not necessarily the treatment itself. Okay. Okay, but the one thing that will change, and I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers the boil water notice that we had um, uh, back in August, so with this change in our treatment, uh, we would not have to issue a boil water notice for the city again. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? Yeah. Member Jordan. Yeah, um, don't want to pull it, but item A, um, we're okay with the number? Yes, sir, I, I sent you the information on that. Oh, you did? Yes, sir. I missed that. Yes, sir, we're okay. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. I see no other. Okay, um, clerk, is there any cards from the public? We have an individual that signed up for item J, and then we have another individual that signed up for six items. And Mayor and Council, I'd like to read the titles for the record. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda item 8A, authorize the purchase of an automatic ambulance stretcher. Consent agenda item 8B, approve change order one with Hinterland Group Incorporated for the South Carpenter Road Water Main Project. Consent Agenda Item 8C, approve the budget transfer for the Osprey Reclamation Facility belt pre filter press rehabilitation. Consent Agenda Item 8D, approve work order for engineering services for the Blue Herring Water Reclamation uh, Facility sludge dewatering project. Consent Agenda Item uh, 8E, authorize the purchase of a battalion chief emergency response vehicle. Consent Agenda Item uh, 8F, purchase an ambulance rescue vehicle. Consent Agenda Item 8G, approve the purchase of a fire engine and associated tools and equipment. Consent Agenda Item 8H, approve FY22 local justice assistance grant. Consent Agenda Item 8I, approve the purchase of vehicles for public works facility. Consent Agenda Item 8J, Approve an emergency work order for the South Street Lift Station Seawall Emergency Repair. Consent Agenda Item 8K, 
uh, increase the approved annual authorized amount for the utility locating services contract. Consent agenda item 8L, approve the work order for the design services for the enhanced water treatment project. Consent agenda item 8M, approve the replacement of solid waste containers and vendor of record addition. Consent agenda item 8N, approve the addition of ready mix concrete to the uh, vendor of record list. Consent agenda item 8O, authorize the mayor uh, to execute mod modification one for the Florida uh, Department of Emergency Services lift station generator grant agreement uh, funding increase. Consent agenda item 8P, approve the collective bargaining agreement between the Laborers International Union of North America Local 630 in the city of Titusville. And consent agenda item 8Q, approve the traffic signal repair at Country Club in Barna. Thank you very much. Um, the clerk, could you uh, call the card for Jay? Yes, Matt Mahaney. I have some handouts also. I apologize. I'm not a regular here. I only printed five of these. Oh, that's so fine. That's fine. I'll, uh, I'll give you mine when I'm done. Name and address for the record, yep. and there Matt you go. Mahoney, 703 Indian River Avenue. I'm in support of item J because I live next to the South Street lift station, and I'm directly affected by the uh, state of the seawall there. That seawall, as you'll see on uh, page one, this is my side of the property. I, this picture was taken yesterday. That's me standing in the sinkhole that was created by the state of the seawall next to me, which is on city property. That um, soil comes out from underneath the seawalls, and it creates uh, a facade on top, so you could actually fall through without knowing that there's a cave underneath that, that seawall, so it is uh, dangerous when that happens. On page uh, two, you'll see the state of the seawall as well, just the hole without me standing in it. Where that caulking is, is a crack in my seawall. And that, uh, I believe, is um, partly caused by the fact that there's no pressure on the back side of that seawall. And if you go to page three, you'll see the city's property, and there's a, a lack of soil on that side providing sufficient back pressure to support that uh, to concrete. On page four, you see uh, a bigger picture of what's going on on the seawall side, the city property at the lift station. There used to be soil there. There should be soil there to support the seawall, and there's not. Uh, that soil was eroded during the hurricane of 2017, Irma. And you can see also that this is the general state of the seawall there. There's a lot of rust in the cap. It's chipped away, and it's just in, in bad shape. Page five is uh, what happened to my property during that hurricane. And I bring this up because uh, I had to repair all this. And so I did, which uh, is a great expense and time and frustration. And um, two months later, you'll see on page seven, uh, actually page seven, it shows you the, the finished part of that repair. So you see the block there on seven. There's no crack in that. It's fresh and new. And then you see the city seawall, which is basically in that state, that same state today. This was in 2017. So it's been in bad, uh, in a bad state since, uh, since then. Uh, page eight just shows, you know, some of the repair that we went through. It's a big project. Page nine shows the million gallons sewage spill that happened basically in my backyard. Page nine shows the effects of that. So you can see all the way through, uh, pretty close to the front of the picture. There's erosion in my property. The sinkholes there that you see. Page 11 shows that corner again. This was after the sewage spill. And so my point here is that uh, I've taken sort of a one-two punch from what's going on right now. The state of the seawall is affecting me financially. Uh, this is a brand new seawall that I built. Good. Got a minute. Can you uh, take, finish it up pretty quick? Yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a brand new seawall. Two months later, I got hit by the sewage spill, uh, eroded it, and so so now I'm affected again. Uh, you see this picture from yesterday, where um, it's it's affecting the, the condition of my property. And you're speaking on J. Yes. And and so I'm assuming you uh, like the emergency work we're going to try to do. I do. I'm here in support of it. I just want to make sure that you hear. Uh, that I was, you under, just, that I was just looking for a good word here today. You, you might not know. <laughs> You, you might not know that uh, that this is happening to me, so I wanted to make sure you knew. I think that was very informative. I really do. And and 
without great detail, I should not even ask, I guess, you're standing in that hole. I am. And that hole got created how? Just by erosion underneath? Erosion. So there's a, there's a hole under your seawall, right? It, it's a seawall. This happens to seawalls with age that you get erosion underneath, underneath. them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Well said. I guess that's it. <laughs> Any other cards? Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just messing with them. Stan Johnston. Same guys, Dan Johnston, 860 Poinsettia Avenue. Uh, let's go over this quickly so you can mark them down. Get, get ready because I'm going to go over them quickly because there's several of them. 8C, neutral, or neither. 8D, neither. Uh, 8J, neither. 8K, neither. 8L, opposed. Uh, and 8O, neither. So let's, let's go over some of those because uh, uh, I have some reservations about some of these, about what's going on. Uh, as, uh, I'm not talking about those. All right, let's go. go ahead. Okay. Go so ahead. so uh, 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 sorry that Laura Lee left because I'm going to mention about what this has to do with what's going oh, she's on. She's here. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right, because uh, anyhow, it has to do with also with what the other fellow was talking about. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Alex Chamberlain, lived right there on the river, South Street, and he complained to me. He said it was just on a, uh, it was on a regular basis that the city dumped sewage right there, dumped it into the river, regular basis, again and again and again. So um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention about uh, uh, eight O. Oh. Neutral. 8O has to do with uh, no, lift stations, generator grant agreement funding increase. Well, I, I want to say neutral about that, but by golly, here's what happened. Of course, Mr. Stoffer left, and I'm complaining about some of these because of Mr. Stoffer, who left, and I don't know why, because that's why he's here. Keep going. I'm, I'm with you. Or not here. So, so um, uh, the, uh, uh, over there on Carroll Avenue, there's a lift station. And during a hurricane, by golly, you know, we had some hurricanes that lasted for a while. And, and I saw for two weeks at a time, two weeks, I'd go out there again and again and again. That sewage lift station was dumping right into the, into the ditch. Wasn't working at all. Dumped right, every time I went, it dumped right into the ditch. In fact, is there was times I'd see, I'd see the, the sewage coming out of the manhole, flowing right into the ditch. It goes right to the river. So, uh... I don't, none of that was reported. None of it was reported to uh, FDEP. Or none of it. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was, of course, it was illegal. Now, on uh, 8L, 8L is work order that Mr. Stoffer was talking to you about. And, of course, he doesn't want to hear what I have to say about that because, because uh, oh, my goodness, and what she left. She left, too, because uh, Stokel left because that was what she should have read. I sent to Mrs. Stokel. Uh, September the 14th, and I'll read it to you. Uh, it's is four log virus. And this is about um, uh, where is that? Uh, where is that? Eight eight o eight o eight o. No, that's not eight o. Lift station. No. Uh, oh my goodness! Where where am I? Uh, talking about the the long virus. Where is that one? That was L, wasn't it? Is that L? Log treatment. Yeah, that's it. It is eight L. Eight L. I'm opposed to that. I'm sorry. I, I got it mixed up with that. Uh, eight L. I'll read it to you. It says August uh, 2021 boil water alert. Uh, unusual ability to qualify for an acceptable treatment of, as required by uh, to meet four log virus requirements. I even sent that to, to Ms. Stokel. I guess she didn't read it. Uh, but what I did was uh, after Mr. Uh, Stauffer reported to the council, as he was requested to do, about the boiled water alert, he said nothing about the four log virus. He said nothing about his two-year planning to correct the problem. Nothing about it. I was here. 
It's on, it's on recording. He said nothing about it. Now he's saying something about it. Of course, it's after I, I, I uh, called, I called FDEP and said, what the heck is going on? And they said, well, you know, here's what's going on. It's it, obviously Mr. Stauffer has been incredibly misleading in what he has told counsel. Dishonest. Four log of hours. Four log means log. Log is to the base 10, 10 to the fourth power. 10 to the fourth power is 10,000. And, and so what, what I wrote here that he just, that apparently, Mrs. Stokel didn't read, it says here, it says four log virus refers to 10 to the fourth power and 99.99% .99 removal of contaminants in potable water prior to consumer use. According to Marty Cardano of FDEP, Tadisville had a similar boiled water notice in 2018, which he did not notice. He did not mention that at all. We had another one. FDEP knows about it. He didn't report it to you at that time. For the same reason, Mr. Stauffer is now considering having cities to qualify the four log virus treatment to prevent this type of flood water alert to ever happen for Titusville water. I want you to understand is that the city of Titusville is one of the very few treatment plants in the United States that has this problem. One of the very few. I don't know of any other place in, in Florida that ha does have it. Titusville, I mean, Titusville is, is you know, it, it's, uh, it's called uh, uh, the Space Coast capital of the world, the Space Coast capital of spraying piss and poop on people, too. It's, it's unique. It certainly is. So, so what happened is that we had restaurants. We had restaurants spending, one of restaurants, I understood, spent over $30,000 loss because of this boiled water alert. And what did he do? You have him come and talk on this podium, and he doesn't tell you the truth. Mr. Stauffer, who's not here right now, not, to, not even telling you the truth. And he's not even here to listen to this. That's what he's paid to do. And he's not even here. I can't understand what's going on. Not, not only that is when I call, when I call the number for water resources, I leave a message. They don't return my calls. When I called and complained about the sewage going into the river, they did not return my calls. When I called and complained about the sewage spraying piss and poop into the, into the cars and people, and also it went into the food, they don't return my calls. When I, when I give pictures to the Florida Today paper and complain to FDEP, the Titusville Police Department, they say contact FDEP or the city of Titusville. I contact FDEP and the city of Titusville, and they do what? Nothing. So why do we have a government here? In other words, why do I come here and talk and you don't do anything as far as responding to this? When I do what Mr. Mr. Uh, Robinson says, he says, call him, contact him immediately. I do it. We've got pictures and photos of saying that what is Mr. Stauffer is doing is he's lying to you. And he still lies to you. He's, he's operating a huge budget, and it's not true. Oh, I better go to another one, because i got, I got some other problems that uh, I should mention about. Uh, on 8, 8D, is that's, a, that's another uh, Mr. Stauffer. 8C and 8D are Mr. Stauffer's uh, concerns. Uh, but 8D has to do with the uh, sludge dewatering project. And my God, I mean, and what do we do with the sludge? It's similar to what, uh, what uh, the city was dumping sewage into the river. They dumped the sludge, they dumped it into the wetlands. The city won't look into that. It's over there near the, near the uh, water tower on South Street. They dumped the uh, lime sludge into the, into the wetlands. Nobody's going to do anything about that. So that's that's uh, let's go to another one. Uh, 8L is also an, an issue about. Um, uh, I went over 8L, and uh, so so uh, what I want to read to you is this right here. It's at the end of this it's an email that I sent to you. Here's what it, it says: How is this possible? In other words, what's going on? This. How our city manager is so wonderful that you've rated him. So how is this possible with all this open and notorious dishonesty, closed doors, gag orders, spraying cars and people with piss and poop, outrageous dishonesty by the FDEP slash consent order, 
that disagrees with claims by Sean Stauffer made, 12, made Jan, January the 12th and many photos and witnesses, including the police department, erroneous, uncorrected flood zones, refusal to comment and discuss issues, etc. Where's the $70,000? You know, where's that $70,000? Where's, where, where is the uh, engineering report about Stan Johnson? Perhaps an exceeds expectation that you've given the city manager is a supporting endorsement of how great a job council achieves by their role as, as his willful puppets of a city manager who is the Pied Piper of dishonesty, outrageous phony baloney, and spraying people with piss and poop. That's, that's the end of it. So, so I want you all to think about what's going on here and what Mr. Stauffer is doing. I, I'm, I, I'd like some more time. I don't think I can get another two minutes. I see none. Okay. Thank you. Any other cards? All right. I need a motion on the uh, consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve consent agenda items 8A through 8Q. I have a motion from Member Jordan. Second. I have a second from Member Stoko. Roll call vote. Member Robinson. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Consent agenda passes unanimously. City Manager, please introduce the ordinances. On to uh, 9A, which is low impact development, second reading and final public hearing. The Titusville Environmental Commission considered this ordinance at their May 12, 2021 and June 9, 2021 meetings and recommended several changes to the ordinance, which are part of your packet. TEC recommended that the terms encourage or encourage to be required or requires. The Planning and Zoning Commission considered this ordinance at their meeting on July 7th, 2021 and recommended approval 7-0, including the TEC's recommendations requiring that the project utilize more, more than one BMP and at 50% of stormwater be processed through LID techniques and adding additional whereas clause. On August 25th, 2020, the City Council approved advisability for staff to develop an ordinance encouraging low impact development through incentives. LID design standards are described in policy 4.1.4 of the coastal management element of the comprehensive plan as site design, engineering, and stormwater management designs and retrofits to re reduce runoff, mitigate flood impacts, and provide on-site absorption, capture, and reuse of rainwater. Low-impact development strategies include design approaches for managing stormwater runoff and protecting water quality, which reduces the ecological burdens on development on the Indian River Lagoon and other uh, local waterways. Should Council wish to consider adopting LID as mandatory, it's estimated an additional engineering review and development performance standards and site-specific criteria will cost between 50 and $100,000 and take approximately one year. Ms. Pisaka has a presentation, I believe. Well, or... Mayor, Mayor, I'd like to read the ordinance oh. at this time. Ty? Yes, yes, please, thank you. Ordinance number 30, 2021. An ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances to adopt low impact development standards, amending Chapter 30 development standards by amending Sections 30-8 technical manuals, 30-163 open space standards, 30-278 satellite parking, 30-324 landscape, and 30-337 permitted uses within the landscape buffer yard, amending Chapter 30 development standards by creating Article 5 low impact development to include sections 30-421 intent and 30-422 lid analysis, amending Chapter 34 procedures by amending Section 34-306 administrative waiver of setback requirements, amending the Development Review Procedures Manual by amending Section 3.4 Applications to be Processed Expeditiously, amending the Stormwater Management Technical Manual Section 7.4 Stormwater Management Design Criteria, amending the Transportation Infrastructure Technical Manual by amending Sections 9.7, 9.16.4, 9.16.8, 9.17.1.1, 9 and 9.19.3 to enable specific lid incentives creating the low impact development technical manual by adding sections 11.1 intent, 11.2 goals of low impact development, 11.3 low impact development plan, 11.4 operations and maintenance O&M documents, 11.5 low impact development LID best management practices BMP list, 11.6 low impact development incentives matrix, and 11.7 minimum parking requirements for development utilizing low impact development 
providing for severability, repeal of conflicting ordinances, and effective date and incorporation into the code. Any questions on that? I see none, staff. I would just like to uh, bring to your attention that as requested by council, this is not a mandatory ordinance. This is an incentive ordinance. And just so you know, there were seven already mandatory uh, LID requirements in the code. And those have been incentivized as they have, are they currently are in the code as incentives. And um, we have additional, about 20 additional incentives. And those are all shown to you on page 919 of your, um, of your package. We were, several people were good enough to send some additional information to me about, uh, from the EPA, and one of them was encouraging low impact development. And there, many of the um, incentives that EPA recommends are contained in here. In addition, there was one called revising local codes to facilitate low impact development. Today, I actually went through and read this for the second time and found that they continue to use the word incentives. In fact, I counted there were four cases where it was recommended that LID was incentives and it. And in this particular, um, there was no recommendation to make these mandatory. However, in the event that council wishes to make them mandatory, it will take time and it will take uh, money as the city manager said so the staff recommends let's get this on the books so that we can have it as an incentive and then when the funds have been identified we can should council wish we can move forward to do the analysis and the engineering that would be be required to consider that this would be mandatory and, and I would add to that <coughs> that I too and I'm not going to hold any cards here. I, I, I want to vote yes and move forward with an LID uh, incentive program right now. And it sounds like that's yeah. the thing to do. Um, while I was at the um, LID seminar, I, I talked to some of our folks, including Ms. K, and I had mentioned that and uh, that I think we get something on the books, get something, you know, in, in the barn. And then, uh, like I've said before about other tree ordinance, actually, uh, you, you can always, you know, tweak it, as uh, Kay reminded me, I said. <laughs> but we can tweak it as we go. But I think that if we miss this opportunity, we've missed an opportunity, and I'd like to, to move forward with that. Um, I would also say that while I was at the LID seminar, there was a uh, speaker that spoke about how to get these things moving, how to get them, you know, into cities and get ordinances. And one of the main things on the PowerPoint program, uh, page 29, or slide 29, I recall, uh, was the incentives. And they gave a whole list of incentives. And I have a picture of the slide on my phone because while Kay and those folks were taking a lot of notes, I was taking pictures of slides. It just seemed easier. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, that's, that's where I'm at with this. Uh, Member Robinson. Well, uh, I was going to say a lot, but since you went to the seminar and they told you everything that I was going to say, so I'm going to just, uh, because those you covered basically is my concern that there's, uh, all this is relatively new. Yes. It's, it's all relatively new and we need to just uh, start it and, and we'll move on Tweet from it. that. Thank you for your briefing, but it covered basically everyone. Thank you. Okay, I see nobody else, so do we have cards? Yes, sir. Um, okay, okay well, let's start. Let's go ahead and start calling cards and we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay, St. Ong. K. St. Ange, Maryland Avenue, Titusville. Thank you, May Mayor Diesel, for attending the Marine Resource Council LID conference last week. I was honored to be able 
to attend this conference as well. Attendees represented 25 jurisdictions, including many policymakers from municipalities and counties who listened intently for two days so that they might learn how to implement LID back in their jurisdictions. Pinellas and Alachua County officials outlined how they developed their excellent LID manuals. Cami Dewey of St. John's River Water Management District discussed the state rulemaking regarding stormwater management, indicating that new state rules expected next year will help advance LID. She indicated that currently St. John's does permit LID BMPs. Um, and so these um, BMPs can be implemented right now. Low impact development is a stormwater management approach that reduces polluted runoff into the lagoon by promoting infiltration into the soil. Trees are the premier LID BMP because as they grow, they become more effective at reducing stormwater runoff while all other BMPs effectiveness declines over time. Developers will need to minimize site disturbance and soil compaction from heavy equipment to maximize infiltration. Clearing of trees and grading needs to be restricted to building sites, driveways, and roads so that undisturbed soils can infiltrate stormwater. LID strategies often save on infrastructure and eliminate or reduce stormwater ponds, a big win for developers. Heed the advice of the EPA, FDEP, Marine Resource Council, and your advisory boards. Adopt LID as a new standard of development in the North Indian River Lagoon Basin. Adopt staff's non-mandatory low-impact development ordinance with the other amendments recommended by TEC and PNZ. After adoption, fund, and develop it should be done. Uh, the uh, per performance standards and site-specific criteria, then amend the ordinance making LID mandatory to include implementation of LID in existing developments as well as new developments. Together with implementation of the tree ordinance, the Basin Management Action Plan requirements, adoptions of an amended mandatory LID ordinance in the near future, Titusville can significantly reduce the pollutant load to the lagoon while building exemplary new developments. Thank you very much. Any questions? No, I, I see none. Thank you, Ms. Kay. Next card, please. Tony Shuffalo. Tony Shuffalo, Norwood House, 715 Tropic Street. The historic my, house. Proudly owned. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read my short but brief. And, but first, I'd like to just extemporize and say that, Mr. Robinson, uh, I don't think that LID is a new thing. I think the techniques that they're using now for the stormwater infiltration is new. But if you think back about the way the land in America has been settled, it was like you'd get a piece of property and you'd clear off a little space and you'd build your house. And then maybe you'd clear off a little space over here and you'd build your barn. And then you might clear, let the animals clear a little trail between. But you wouldn't come in with bulldozers taking everything down, impacting the soil, disrupting the microorganisms under Underneath the soil so that nothing will grow in the dead soil anyway after you plant your twig magnolia or your um, crepe myrtle. While technically LID is a stormwater management approach to development, it really is a method to save natural resources, prevent polluted stormwater runoff, and build site-specific installations. Now, Kay just said that developers will need to minimize site disturbance and soil compaction from heavy equipment to maximize the infiltration. Clearing of trees and grading needs to be restricted to the building sites. If LID is effectively applied, developers can save on curbing infrastructure and large treatment ponds, allowing the building of more houses on the site. We need you to adopt LID as a standard in Titusville and North Brevard. Adopt staff's LID ordinance. We would prefer with the amended, amendments recommended by TEC and PNZ of making the ordinance mandatory, but I agree. We can't do everything at once. It's gonna take, it's taken two years for us to get to, get to the Carter House to get your ramp, for instance. All right, three years, yeah, it precedes me. Um, 
but we have to start and and we have an example we could be an example for everybody instead of being you know those people right. up in Titusville are just letting those manatees die and they keep dumping sewage water and blah, blah, blah. And I just want to say I was so proud to see the, our mayor at that LID conference. It was very, it was wonderful to see him there with all these experts and other county officials and stuff and to be able to say. Yeah. We were there. I was there. I wasn't an expert, but I was there. Thank you very much. Next card, please. Kathleen Perez. I'm Kathleen Perez. I live at 3025 South Washington Avenue in Titusville. And I just wanted to say that I agree with most of the things that have already been said. I'd like to see the, um, the LID measure adopted and then later tweaked to make it mandatory. I don't know how many of you looked at the uh, headline this morning in the Florida Today, but it was uh, manatee deaths nearing 1,000. So the clock's ticking. We're going, we're still going in the wrong direction. And I think the people of Titusville want us to go in the right direction. And it takes courage. It takes courageous leadership. We, I think the time to do things like the way they've always been done is over. And I hope that I'm speaking for a lot of people in Titusville and saying that we have to take this seriously and get it done now. And we can't be saying stuff anymore like, well, don't make development any harder. We, I think that time has passed. Thank you. Next card, please. The last card is Stan Johnston. Stan, how come you always get to be last? I don't know. I, I, I'm not uh, against this. Uh, I'm in a position of neither. Um, I have a concern with just what uh, uh, Peggy Busaka explained, and that is that uh, uh, are we really uh, equipped to review this? Uh, do we have the personnel, the ability, the knowledge to do this? So uh, that's just a concern. And the, another concern is about enforcement, because what we saw today right here in City Hall, we saw an example of rewarding dishonesty here's what I predicted and I put it in writing I predicted that uh, even though I've exposed Mr. Stauffer as being dishonest to counsel about his report about the uh, uh, boiled water notice very misleading and I'd say just dishonest is that, uh, and I put it in writing here. You got it in writing here today. I said to you, I put it in writing, and it says that uh, uh, that I predict that city manager and council will continue to adore Mr. Stauffer's outrageous dishonesty, and that's what we did. He was rewarded tonight for his dishonesty. He wasn't even outside of the room during the discussion. So was uh, Dr. Stokel on this. Uh, Poor log virus. It's a big issue. So how are we going to even enforce against people violating these LID when we can't even enforce honesty in our director of water resources? I don't see you can do it. I don't see that city can can let's say honestly or or let's say uh, fairly uh, enforce codes on people and have our 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 top guys being completely dishonest in front of uh, in front of uh, council. In other words, this this uh, this thing about this boiled water alert that what he gave you was a bunch of phony baloney when he reported to you. He didn't tell you that he'd been working on the project. He didn't tell you about four log virus. So the question is, how can we do this? How can we implement the LID? If we can't do something simple like this, I mean, it happened right here in council. You saw it right here. Rewarding dishonesty. Thank you. Council, anything you want to, uh, member Jordan, Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve ordinance number 30 dash 2021 as recommended by staff. Second. I have a motion from member Jordan, a second from Vice Mayor, roll call vote. 
Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. LID passes unanimously. And I do at least have to add, d despite sometimes I feel like we're we're getting a whooping up here there uh, for, for things that I'm like, okay, that was eight years ago. I was, I was still uh, coaching golf somewhere, but um, I'm very proud of the fact that this council in the last month, maybe longer, but in the last month, it's just passed a tree ordinance and passed an LID ordinance. And is it everything some of you want? No, but is it some hay in the barn? Yeah, it is. And I can tell you that if you, I don't believe that I'm hearing or looking around and seeing other councils in our area put as much time in, man, boy, and you guys know, this has been years on the tree ordinance. LID was kind of right behind it, but I don't feel like it was quite as long. So that being said, I'm very proud of our efforts, uh, city manager, staff, Ms. Busaka, you guys, and um, you know, I'm, I'm just proud of the council. I'm proud of where we're going. and. Uh, we are a city that doesn't want to go backwards. We got the next group coming up on that. We are a city that wants to grow. We are a city that I don't ever want to see go back to 2008. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to have some rules and a rule book as we move forward. So with that, thank you again very much. And uh, city manager. On to item 9B, which is ordinance 3121-2021 relating to social services in the Indian River Neighborhood Zoning District. This will be your first reading, Planning and Zoning Commission. We'll consider this ordinance at their meeting on November 3rd, 2021, City Attorney. Ordinance number 31, 2021, an ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending the land development regulations by amending the definition of social services contained in Section 28-21 Indian River City Neighborhood Zoning, Subsection C, Nonconforming Uses, providing severability, repeal of conflicting ordinances, an effective date, and incorporation into the code. Council, any comments, or excuse me, staff? Uh, I'm here if there's any questions. Council? Uh, Member Robinson, I see you're like. Oh, no. Okay. Here we go. All right, so this is the first reading? Okay, first reading. We have any cards? No, sir. Okay, with that, we, uh, city manager. On to uh, item. 9C, which is Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Application Number 1-2020, Titusville Mall. This, uh, go ahead. You want to read first? All right. This is the biggie. So. Um, excuse me. I think we did have a card. I'm sorry. Say again. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Is this the card? This here? Yes. yes. We had two cards. They were not marked correctly. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We got time. So Ed Springer. And this is on the Indoor River City deal? Yes, sir. Okay. We just have, I'm Ed Springer, uh, Hopkins Avenue. I live down the street. Uh, I was driving by where a business had moved out a while back. It was a computer outfit. And then I saw a new sign out. It said Aries, A-Y-R-E-S. And then a couple of days later, I said, oh, well, I went by it. Now, all of a sudden, it says recovery treatment. And we just were questioning why they were allowed in, this, in our area to begin with. Now, we have something that we got from the city, and it says that their specified use would be outpatient substance abuse treatment. But they said no medications are dispensed or administered in our offices. Now, we have their letterhead that came from their attorney that says their recovery together is a corporation that offers psychological treatment services to individuals suffering from substance abuse and addiction, to get, and together with them, including administrating uh, Soxicon, I believe it's like Oxycontin, to patients to reduce and eliminating drug cravings and conducting group therapy sessions led by counselors. Now, we really... Our biggest problem when we went into the city and got this Indian River City neighborhood put into effect was because we had a lot of uh, indigents, people that were being released from where they were sooner than they should have been, and then they were just turned loose 
in our neighborhood because they couldn't get their money that was in the bank at the business until the end of the month or something like that. So they were always going around harassing. So we started this process, we got it approved, and it's like we accept that the businesses, commercial businesses are on the outer skirts, US-1, Hopkins, Highway 50, and stuff like that, but that the, and also on Knox McRae we allow that because that was an established place. But we have other businesses that we, uh, inside the area. We didn't want, it's supposed to be family homes and businesses were coming in and buying them and turning them into businesses and just creating more traffic than the neighborhood was designed for. And we were just trying to figure out how they got their license to open first. I understand in the reading they got something from the state of Florida that gave them a temporary person. Uh, a temporary permit and we were just wanting to know we don't really agree with this and we want to know what we need to do with the city I don't know if maybe we can just take that they want to remove the counseling part out of that our biggest problem is we want the drug spreading out is we don't we don't want that we've experienced it we fought it we got it under control. It's been very nice. We've had one or two incidences, a couple of them the other day, that happened, and but they were just minor things, just people that had to leave, right. and then we're still in the neighborhood. And then when I saw that, I was going to call Laura to find out what was going on, Laura Ward. Right. Uh, she couldn't well, be here. here. Let's, to, let's stop because we've got our three minutes, but I think I got your point. Is there anything we can add to that, Ms. Busaka, concerning what, why this is back? Or maybe you're not the one to add that. Well, I, I heard several questions, but it, it might be easier. Do you want to start with the reason this came up, or do you want me to start about the specifics of this, this one issue? Well, I can introduce why okay. it came up. There's a letter attached to your agenda item right. explaining why it came up. Uh, we've had uh, an applicant who wants to do counseling services. Now, I'm understanding that I'll let... Peggy talk about the, the code and the planning is that we do allow professional offices, medical offices. You can counsel your law clients or your accountants, or you can have a psycho psychiatrist, no. oh, yes. psychiatrist do counseling. This individual, if, if you're not a psychiatrist, but you're licensed uh, to do counseling, we said, no, you can't counsel. And so they said, well, now you're discriminating, especially in this case with individuals who may be recovering, which is a disability. So now we're allowing some people to get medical counseling or psychi psychiatric care, but not other mental health counseling. And so that threat of federal litigation is what brought this uh, about. Staff has looked at it, and I let Peggy discuss uh, Indian River City and where this could or couldn't go with regard to you have your residential core and you have your commercial aspects of the plan and the neighborhood and where those can go. And I think we're talking about the, the commercial aspect. But the reason this came to this level is uh, we do not want a code that is discriminatory. And and I'll let Peggy talk about what the code allows and doesn't allow, but as to why this is here now is because we do have that allegation the staff has looked at that as applied, this would be discriminatory is the claim. First of all, I want to say that the reason that this code exists is because of the Indian River City Neighborhood Plan, which took about seven years to develop. And part of this plan says to prohibit the introduction of new social services and the expansion of existing social services in the neighborhood, encompassing the entire boundaries of the plan, which includes both the residential and the uh, commercial. And this plan is developed in kind of a donut shape where there along the major roadways there is a commercial out outer ring and then the residential is in the inside so because of this plan says that these social services are to be kept out of the entire boundary of the plan there are a list of non-conforming uses which are not permitted to be expanded. And those lists, and I will read the definition of social services. 
as public, not-for-profit or private businesses that use or, or uses that provide services to persons, including but not limited to counseling, food provision, emergency or short-term housing services, and employment services, excluding community residential homes as defined in section 419.001 Florida statutes. So that's the code that the, count, that the staff has been evaluating when someone comes in. What happened was that in, in this particular instance, the name of the group is Groups Recover Together. And Groups Recover Together came in in September and requested a business tax receipt, occupational license. When the staff asked what they were doing, they were told that they were licensed physicians, which are permitted. Subsequent to that, the count, the, um, because they needed to get what they called a zoning verification letter in order to get their state license for this location, this, they wrote on their zoning verification letter, outpatient substance abuse treatment. So when we asked about that, we wrote them a letter saying, we're sorry, but outpatient substance abuse treatment would fall into counseling. So we told them that they could not obtain the business tax, the um, zoning verification letter they needed for their state license. It was shortly after that when Mr. Broom came into my office and explained that he knew it was Monday because he had received a letter about a federal lawsuit. So the staff honestly has had concerns about this particular language for quite some time. We, um, as the Supreme Court once said, if a, a policeman has to understand the law, so should a planner. So we are, we understood that this was probably, in our opinion, discriminatory against the ADA, which I believe is the intent of the letter that you have in your um, folder. And so what we're suggesting is the smallest change that we can make, we believe, to get out from underneath this ADA issue, and that is to remove the word counseling. Um, I think that the fact that one member of the staff asked questions and found out that it was there were licensed physicians and so said it was approvable, and another staff member received another piece of information saying that it was counseling, shows you how very difficult just this one word can be in trying to interpret it. Now, I did get a phone call about what would happen if this went into the residential area. We do not permit any offices in any zoning category that is strictly residential. We have one zoning category called office professional, which in some instances will allow um, residentials but residences, but basically office professional is a um, commercial. So if you want to be a commercial business, you have to be in a commercial zoning. And that's true in Indian River City as well. However, the state has now preempted the ability for home occupations. And that legislation occurred recently. You're going to get to see an ordinance in the not too distant future amending that. So if someone comes to the counter and says, I want to be an, a counselor, a physician, a car mechanic, it really doesn't matter. And I want to have that on my residence. We have to give them a BTR. So we can't tell someone they can't have a home occupation for counseling or drug addiction or anything else. What we can tell them is that if you're a professional office, you have to be in a certain zoning category. I know that's probably more than you wanted to know. Stuff I didn't know. So <laughs> <laughs> I just found out about this two days ago. So yeah, <laughs> and we know how that goes. Um, that being said, it, it seems to me the it, this is back because of a federal lawsuit that says we're violating ADA and um, without the counseling, correct? Yes, yes sir. And so that's why we are where we are. Right. And it sounds to me the staff is trying to be as 
uh, balanced with the, the wording as possible to mm -hmm. not open up a can of worms. It does not look like we're talking about anything other than counseling. That's correct. We, I believe one dis description was this is a, a surgical approach. We are trying to be very specific to get rid of this because this seems to be the issue that we're confronted with at this moment. All right, that's what we got. All right. Well, we're not, con we understand commercial is commercial, you know, and I can understand changing that part where the commercial can come in there and have the, our, our biggest problem is the, are they dispensing drugs on site and giving them and then the people, I know they're coming there for counseling, they might not be driving and then they're going to walk away with their counseling. Keep, keep me from being shaky pill. And Ms. <laughs> uh, Bissock, is there anything to add to that? Or? The only thing I have is the zoning verification letter request, which says no medications are dispensed or administered in our offices. That's all we got. That's all you got. That's all we got. All right. I think I know Ms. Ward received a copy of this. Letter. Yes, she did. She, okay. her, she had Good. an emergency with her husband. Well, I just didn't know. I'm yeah. sorry to hear that, but I didn't know if you needed a copy of it as well. But I, I think I've got okay, all that. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what I had my copy and everything like that. I, I just wanted to approach the council. No, I appreciate let us it. know our concerns and, about it. And we kind of opened like that up, so I'm glad, you know, we probably gained a little more too. Since we've had since we've had the plan, everything has been very nice right. in the neighborhood. We, we've enjoyed it. We're, we appreciate everything that the council did for us to stop it because it was just eating away at the homes. You know, and then it wasn't going to be a neighborhood anymore. It was going to be another business district. And but we do appreciate that. And I just we just wanted to find Thank out you. what was going on. And we know this is the first reading. Right. Thank right? you. Thank okay. you so much. And we still want you to speak at that breakfast when we have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, next card. Mark Frank. Well, hello, everyone. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you, Daniel, Mayor Daniel, and distinguished panel. Um, today, I want to let you know, I feel, and my opinion feels, that we have an eyesore in Titusville, and we know it's Titusville Mall. We took care of Titus Landing years ago, and I feel right now that yep. this is really going to be a jump We're not in on our growth. Hold up. Hold up. We're not time on out. that item yeah, yet. Yeah, time out. We're not on that item yet. That's the item that okay. I'm on. Yeah. Do we, so I'll okay, start again so, later. <laughs> hold on. So that card is not for this. Yeah, they mark ten instead of nine. No, no, no. But we're going to get to that like right now. So hold on. Okay. So now we are past that one, right? No more cards on that one. Okay. Now we can move into the next one. City manager, I think you already moved us into the next one, but you want to do it again? Yes, sir. Uh, city attorney will read uh, the three ordinances uh, as part of the comprehensive plan amendment number 1-2020 for the Titus Mall. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Ordinance number 27-2021. An ordinance of the city of Titusville, Florida, amending the code of ordinances by amending ordinance number 60-1988, which adopted the comprehensive plan of the city of Titusville. By adopting comprehensive plan amendment 1-2020, amending the future land use map of the comprehensive plan by replacing the commercial high intensity future land use designation with the urban mixed use future land use designation on approximately 22 acres of land located west of South Washington Avenue, east of South Hopkins Avenue, south of Country Club Drive and north of Narvez Drive and having an address of 3550 South Washington Avenue, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Ordinance number 28, 2021 an ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances by amending Ordinance Number 60-1988, which adopted the Comprehensive Plan of the City of Titusville. By adopting Comprehensive Plan Amendment 1, 2020, amending the future land use element of the Comprehensive Plan by changing Policy 1.11.15 to add the maximum density and intensity for redevelopment site number 2, 3550 South Washington Avenue, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Ordinance number 29, 2021, an ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending ordinance number 5, 1993 of the City of Titusville, Florida, by amending the zoning map made a part of said ordinance by reference by replacing the regional commercial RC zoning district with the urban village UV zoning district on approximately 22 acres of land located west of South Washington Avenue, east of South Hopkins Avenue, South Country Club Drive, and north of Narvez Drive, and having an address of 3550 South Washington Avenue, and providing for an effective date. The State Land Planning Agency had no objections to the comprehensive plan amendments 
the Planning and Zoning Commission acting as your local land uh, planning agency considered these items at their October 6, 2021 recommended approval with conditions as recommended by staff 7-0. At the October 12, 2021 regular meeting, City Council provided input on the master plan uh, dated September 20th, 2021. The applicant has since revised the open space and resubmitted the master plan dated October 15th, 2021. According to the applicant, the updated open space plan delineates larger public gathering spaces. The applicant has added a, a precedent imagery to help illustrate the intentions. Also, the applicant has shifted the pool amenity to the south to create a larger open space and associated plaza to the north. The applicant stated that this should uh, further increase the public space and improve the linkages between the other open space areas on the site. It should be noted that the area surrounding the swimming pool and associated plaza is also designated as a storm water retention area. In addition to the new plan, in addition, the new plan does not include any rooftop open space, so the staff is recommended relating to the proposed amenity as shown in the staff report, has been eliminated uh, from the recommended list below. The applicant, Jesse Wright, on behalf of property owners, Titusville uh, Mall LLC, is requesting to amend the comprehensive plan and rezone the property located at 3550 South Washington Avenue to allow for redevelopment of Titusville Mall, formerly known as Sears Town Mall. The applicant is requesting to change the future land use map designation from commercial high intensity to urban mixed use. Amend policy 1-11-15 of the future land use element to include a maximum floor ratio of the residential density and rezone the property from regional commercial zoning district to urban village. The request also includes a master plan as required by the UV zoning district. Ms. Busaka has a presentation for council prior to the applicant. Thank you, Ms. Busaka. I promise to make it quick. There's three ordinances, and I thought it would be easy for easier if we start with what those are. The first one is the land use amendment, which would be this is the map amendment going from commercial high intensity to urban mixed use. That is consistent with the code, which designates the Titusville Mall site as the second urban village redevelopment area, and is required in order to get to the urban mixed use. So that's the first is the future land use map. The second is the text amendment. The code, I'm uh, sorry, the um, comprehensive plan requires that whenever a urban village is, uh, urban mixed use is designated as a land use and urban village, that there be specificity for maximum uh, intensity of that. In this case, the Floor area ratio is 0 0.3, and it's shown as a maximum of 15 dwelling units an acre. This is consistent with the same, uh, this is consistent with what Titus Landing has as its maximum. So we have two, we would have two designated that would be consistent as far as intensity. The second is the rezoning. It's currently community commercial, and that would go toward urban, urban village. The Urban village zoning requires a mix of land uses designated to be compatible and complementary. I think that that's a decision that council needs to make. The council also requires the project will provide urban amenities and public meeting areas and requires a master plan. That brings us to the master plan. As you can see there's about 22 acres here with 340 apartment units, which is the 15 units an acre over the entire property, plus 231,000 square feet of non-residential, which includes retail, hotel, restaurants, and medical office. And you can see the building heights are proposed to be between 35 and 90 feet. A conditional use permit will be required, and you'll see those height again. The master plan issues that we have identified and that the applicant is aware of is that um, the street design has to be done has to be consistent with private streets the, this will be reviewed at the site plan 
you may remember that you saw that there was screening on Narvez, and that's also shown in the information you have in your package. The multifamily phasing, staff would like to see the multifamily go along in phases so that you don't end up with just a commercial use. You have the multifamily and the commercial open space we are going to get to in a minute. Currently, there is no stormwater treatment on the site. This project has in much improved stormwater, sheltered bicycle racks, cross access to three of the four corners. Uh, traffic study has been provided and shows that based on the 298,000 290, yeah, 298, uh, that are currently on the site and square footage versus the 231 that there's actually a slight reduction. I think that you will see more traffic than you see now because the plan was based on the fact that it would be the maximum use of the property, not the diminished use that you see now. Uh, there will be a master drainage and sewer plan. Open space was an issue, so I wanted to bring to your attention the definition of that, which is that it would be the open space is intended designed for recreational use of residents and visitors and to assure the proper internal buffering of land uses. Specifically on this project, 25% is required. The code says both passive, such as picnic areas and walking trails, and active, that there should be urban plazas for public use and that stormwater may be used as passive open space with improvements, but that it may not interfere with the stormwater function. This is a picture, uh, and this is slightly different from what you've seen before. The swimming pool is uh, moved to the south, and you may note that red area going uh, horizontally, that is, according to the information we've been provided, decking. The areas that you see that are large and green are the stormwater facilities. This is a, a simpler to show you that all these green areas are have been provided as open space. The purple areas are being shown as secondary open space. But according to the applicant, the green areas do meet the 25%. These are examples that they have provided of what these areas could look like upon their final completion. They include uh, the area to the upper left is what they're suggesting would happen along Hopkins. The area at the upper right it would be their gardens there. And you can see those. Um, I don't know how to point out to you, but the, the large triangle to the kind of in the middle of the project, a little bit to the right of the project, south of the hotel is um, one of those water features that they were showing that would basically allow people to see planted areas and the stormwater is treated as LID, actually. And the way that they would have their paseo or open area that they could use for a plaza. And that is all I have. If you have any questions, I will do my best. Mayor, before we get to questions, I just want to point out this is a comprehensive plan amendment, which comprehensive plan amendments on these changes are legislative. It does also include a rezoning and a master plan, which the report says is quasi-judicial. So I was just going to point out some of the quasi-judicial procedures that might apply to a rezoning uh, and verify with the clerk. And, and advise that during the public hearing portion of the meeting, anyone wishing to speak on a quasi-judicial item must first sign a public hearing agenda card and sign the oath contained thereon. They're located on the table at the entrance and must be submitted uh, to the clerk. Any photographs, sketches, or documents you desire for the council to consider should be submitted to the clerk into evidence and will be retained by the city. Clerk of all persons wishing to speak, sign with card swearing to tell the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. Have all witnesses that intend to speak with regard to staff and applicant sign an oath card swearing to tell the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. If, if there's anyone present who has not signed an oath card that wishes to speak on a quasi-judicial item, please submit a card to the clerk at this time. City clerk, have all agenda items been properly advertised? 
In the event a council member has received any ex parte communications on a quasi-judicial item outside of this hearing, the council member shall disclose the identity of the person, group, or entity, entity with whom the communication took place, the subject of the communication, including all opinions or facts discussed. And any written communications on a quasi-judicial item must be disclosed and made a part of the record. Also, in the event a member has conducted an investigation or site visit or received expert opinions on a quasi-judicial item, these should also be disclosed. We need to disclose that now, then. Yeah. Yes, sir, with regard no. to any quasi-judicial ex parte communication. Anybody on council have any meetings or anything? I did. Um, it's been a while, but I do want to, and I had uh, Ms. Busaka and city manager there as well. Uh, so I met on the project with the officials. Okay, with that, um, and let me just say, it was just an informational thing. I don't think I was even allowed to ask questions, but uh, they were they were on top of me there. It would just be important if you had any opinions during that meeting that you, or that you've taken from that meeting to disclose any opinions that you have so they can understand that. You have I mean, you know. <laughs> What do you say? I have opinions, but uh, <laughs> talk to the <them. laughs> <Talk to them. laughs> Hey, you got a lot to talk out there. All right, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and move on. Um, and you're done, Ms. Bosaka. Let me say that was that was excellent. Um, I really appreciate. It. After having met with you, oh. I'm getting my days mixed up. I think it was yesterday. There was a lot there, and you just kind of sorted it out for us. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Uh, the applicant would be first up, Mr. Wright. Good evening. Good evening. I want to appreciate uh, working with uh, Ms. Vosaka and also Mr. Brad Parrish. I think it's been a wonderful relationship. You know, I've worked in multiple cities in Alabama and Tennessee and Mississippi, and I really haven't been that close to be able to um, relate information back and forth to the planning. Before you go further, Mr. Wright, I, I, we know who you are, but can you stay on the microphone, please? Sure. Jesse Wright, uh, Torrance, California, and I'm the applicant. Um, this project, uh, I guess the only other project that would be similar to this would be the uh, Titus Landing. It was a $65 million project, and they introduced retail and medical. In our project, uh, which is probably going to be running close to about 120 million, 70 million on the residential, <clears throat> 25 million on the hotel, and 25 million for the power center, we would have six different components. We would have residential, hospitality, retail, aged, restricted, independent senior living, uh, and which requires less parking, medical, and offices. The retail portion of the project, which is just below the, um, may I just uh, display some of the, uh, oh, absolutely. is that okay? Absolutely, it's your presentation. You're good. Yeah, you're upside down there. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to need to bring over closer to the microphone so the TV people can hear you. There you go. Perfect. So the existing mall, the way it stands right now, uh, Sears is located on US-1. And I'm basically showing you the demolition area as to what portion is going to be demoed so we won't be disturbing other businesses. So first phase would be basically covering... Sears, Cinema, and a few other tenants, all the way up to Bell's Outlet, which is right here. The second phase will go into the rest of the mall to be able to build the uh, commercial portion. And the last phase would be the antique mall. That's after we build the space for them. So I wonder if you can mark, please, Frank. That's I'll pay you extra for this. Um, <laughs> um, so the, uh, you're looking at the, um, the 340 apartments, which is basically a building F and G. 
recently we've uh, discussed this with, uh, with, with Mr. Parrish and, and, and Peggy to change the building L, which is the F, to independent senior living. Um, that would be age restricted, uh, about 55 plus. One of the reasons that I'm going with my gut feeling on this, because there is no market for uh, the senior living right now. Again, I've seen some studies from other projects that basically indicates that the market isn't there to lease out to senior living. You know, I've seen some of the feasibilities. But going by my gut feeling, I think that would be necessary down the road, mainly because of the seniors be able to actually go down and go to the commercial portion. Like, for example, a... Uh, uh, a pharmacy or a health center or a chiropractor or something similar services like that. And they would be able to mingle with younger people in the 240 apartments right across with the uh, pool there in the middle. Um, so that's basically the project. Um, and I want to just cover a few other things. Um, the um, I would anticipate that this project would generate close to about 315 jobs. We have three restaurants, about 13,000 square feet, about 45 jobs there. Uh, and also going into the hotel, about 153 rooms. I anticipate we would have probably about 53 jobs. Uh, from the um, retail, about 75. And from the medical plaza on Hopkins, about 97, because that's about 100,000 square feet. So. I would imagine we would be somewhere around 315 jobs, approximately. Uh, we would anticipate the number of residents to be about 825. Um, the hotel is being discussed, whether it be a Hampton Inn or a, um, um, a choice hotel, double brand with a short and a long-term stay. We have added public um, gathering, which uh, Ms. Busaka just discussed. Yeah, so that would be the next one. Yeah, actually, the next one would be. Yeah. So, as she discussed earlier, we would plan on having festivals and art shows and things like that uh, for the people that are living there and also for the public. Um, talking about the uh, open space, uh, Mr. Bruce Hall is going to be covering that, uh, my planner. As far as the apartments and the height, I want to kind of cover that now. Uh, we were looking for about 80 to 90 feet. Uh, we're now looking at 62 to about 65 feet to be the height of the apartments, uh, six story. On the hotel side, we'll be looking at around 72 to 74 feet because the high rise would be 75. We want to be below that. Uh, minor modifications, as we discussed earlier with, uh, with Brad and also with Peggy, would be the following. Initially, we were looking to put a pool on top of the hotel that would take away space from people that are going to be looking at the rockets, rock launches, and things like that. So we're planning on putting the, the, uh, the, the hotel in the lobby area on the first floor. That would be with the, um, with the management office, front desk, and so on and so forth. So we're making that change. Also, we're looking at a possibility of having the uh, same observation deck on top of the senior living for the seniors to be able to go up and also see the rocket launches separate from the, uh, the public. <clears throat> we talked about the age restricted and also uh, I've had discussions with, uh, with the planning, with the staff to limit the medical to about 75% uh, of the 100,000 square feet that we're gonna be building. I think there's gonna be a tremendous amount of medical need down the road especially the pandemic that we're in right now. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, 
I would like to request if you could maybe watch the video, which is about three minutes and 14 seconds. Uh, from there, I'd like to invite Mr. Rodney Honeycutt to come up and discuss the civil portion. Uh, Mr. Bruce Hall, that would be discussing the planning portion. And also Joseph uh, Ravira, that is gonna be discussing traffic. Now, of course, we'll have less traffic now because of senior living. And then we have three other people that uh, Mark Frank, of course, sitting in the front, and Lisa and also Cindy Mott that is sitting in the back. We've been waiting for hours <laughs> to talk. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. Otherwise, we can watch the video and then answer any questions you have. Yeah, I see no question. Titusville Resort and Destination is located at 3550 South Washington Avenue, or US-1, across from Cape Canaveral and NASA. The project, on the first phase, covers two restaurants, a 3,000 square feet of drive through and 5,000 square feet of sit-down restaurant facing US-1. In addition to six-story multifamily apartments with 170 one-bedrooms, 100 two-bedrooms, in addition to 73 bedrooms, including 45 penthouses, the apartment complex has a pool and clubhouse. A 25,000 square feet retail will be built on the first floor of the L-shaped building facing Country Club Drive. The developer may consider up to 100 of the 340 apartments become independent senior living age restricted. A 65,000 square feet of parking garage will be built under the U-shape apartment building. A seven-story, 153-room hotel with pool and observation deck on the top floor is on a third phase of the project facing Indian River with view. A road off, Country Club Drive, will separate phases one and three from phase two, which will be built facing Hopkins Street. Commercial portion has roughly 99,000 square feet of commercial, consisting of 46,400 square feet of medical and offices, plus 52,450 square feet of retail. A 14,000 and 20,000 square feet of retail will face Hopkins Street. In order to do this project, we will demo the mall in phases in order to not disturb certain businesses that already are in the mall. The residents will have access to both medical, offices, and retail. The hotel guests can stay on a long and short stay. Open space and amenities are provided, and we meet the maximum parking requirements. Please visit Titusville Resort and Destination.com for additional information. If I may ask Mr. Honeycutt to come first, and Bruce Hall and Joseph come up right after. Bruce. Perfect. If that's okay. Yes, absolutely. You, you run that show and we'll keep watching. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, Rodney Honeycutt, 3700 South Washington Avenue in Titusville. Um, I'm pleased to um, have been working on this project. I think it's a great project for the city. Um, there are several positive things I think that will happen. Um, there'll, there'll be a 50 or 60 year old building that will be removed and replaced with new structures. Um, it's going to actually be a mixed use site. 
uh, residential and commercial and medical and restaurants on the same site. That means there's a lot of people that can walk to retail, medical, restaurants, never leave, you know, never get in their car, have to leave the site. Um, there's more space for viewing launches at a higher elevation. Um, Off-site stormwater that goes directly to the Indian River now will be treated. And uh, on-site stormwater that goes directly to the Indian River will be treated. I don't know if you've been by the site and looked, but there's curbing along the east property line, except there's one opening where everything's directed to a catch basin right on the outside of the site, which collects. So it's just typical of an old mall like this, and so it's going to be fantastic to have this improvement. Um, there'll be updated on-site utilities. They're 60 years old. Most utilities have a maximum of about 50-year life, if you're lucky. Um, there'll be a landscape site. I think there's probably two or three trees on the site now, maybe, at the best. Um, and the current users that are on the site that choose to stay will have a new facility. And so I think those are great things. It's, it's not a difficult site to design. Uh, it'll be a little bit complex because they're doing it in phases, um, but it's, it's going to be a great site, and I appreciate your support for this project. Any questions? Any questions for Rodney? Uh, Member Robinson. Yes, uh, Rodney. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot to be in that small area, isn't it? Uh, and do you have some concern about all of that being? I know it's two. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Twenty-two. Uh, how much land is it? Twenty-two thousand. How much? How, how much area? Oh, there's twenty-one and a half. Tw almost twenty-two acres. You know. Okay, and that's going to be a lot in there, um, according to, you know, that was uh, what I just saw on the video is larger than my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's larger than mine too. And, you know, I can, I can. It, it takes me longer than that driving around my hometown than I uh, that video. But that's a lot that's in that uh, in that area. Is that going to be some problem with drain off? And I know it's going to you're going to use state of the art, you know, for storm water and, and and all of that. But um, are, are you at all concerned about uh, all that being in one spot? It's a lot more. It doesn't seem like it's as spread out according um, to the pictures that I have. It, it's more intense than other sites that we have in Titusville. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the only one that's a mixed-use site like this we can use. But uh, if you go to Orlando, it's actually less dense than typical sites. And that's kind of the thing that happens in a more urbanized area. Okay. And so I think it'll be great for the All city. Right. <clears throat> And in all of that, I know that you're going to have the, the storm drain. Is any of your, uh, is going to be Purvis? Uh, uh, um, we, don't, we don't have any uh, pervious pavement proposed Correct. at this point. Uh, it could be, but we do have proposed underground treatment, and we do have rain gardens, low impact, and, and we do have dry, dry swells which are more low impact than wet. We don't have any proposed wet ponds. Yeah. And when you say, uh, you know, the low impact uh, drain site with the trees and the garden, that's just small areas. There's three talking. of those areas, right. yes. Okay. All righty. That's, that's for now. That's, uh, Member Stokoe. Okay. Yeah, since Member Robinson brought it up, that's been my concern as I've been sitting on this. Like, I've been very excited to see this site get developed, but... I'm having some, I don't feel like this is urban mixed use. I'm seeing like one side, really high intensity living, residential, hotel, senior living, and then like a side with some retail and trying to throw in some like open space. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's a lot. It's just a lot and I'm having a hard time seeing how this is going to work, if I'm being honest. Um, it's just, it, when you talk about Orlando, that's downtown Orlando, you have a lot going on. This is in the middle of neighborhoods on US-1. It's just not Orlando. So, I don't know, that's kind of where I am right now. So, um, downtown Orlando is much more dense than anything like this. Um, 
but um, in the outlying areas is where I'm thinking about. I mean, that's that's typical. And it's not it's not compact. It's actually promotes more walking and less driving and things like that. But I understand. And I wish I could get if we were kind of going toward a more residential living. And I I just not. To me, when I see urban mixed use, I think more of Titus Landing, more walking, more retail, more eating, walking around, enjoying, maybe build apartments on top for another level, kind of like Vieira, not to that extreme, but you have a lot going on. To me, when I'm looking at this, I'm like, would I come there or do I feel like it's really for the people that live in the apartment? I, it, I don't know. I keep going back to what was on Peggy's slide. Is it compatible and is it complementary? And then that's where I'm having a hard time, kind of, right now. Vice Mayor. Well, I sort of disagree. <laughs> um, I was I was very concerned about it two weeks ago because I felt like there wasn't the open space that needed to be there. And sorry, but I was like, I don't think anybody having a hotel wants me to bring 50 kids up there and say, ooh, this is open public space. We're going to all tramp through the uh, lobby and go up there. So I appreciate the fact that you guys changed that. And I think this is sort of the future in that we have the, the residential areas where people, yeah, I, I agree. The, um, the retail, the medical is really more for those people than the rest of us who aren't maybe living there. I, I think we can go there. If our doctor's there, obviously we're going to go there. If uh, we want a service that uh, is provided there, we're going to go there. But I think for the most part, the idea of urban, urban village is that we have um, an area where there's a large population and there are um, facilities to support that large population. So this, it looks a little crowded. I don't think it's going to look quite that crowded in the end. All right, I agree. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? I'll just add that I like the uh, the apartment living. I like the hotel. Uh, I like the the mixed use, and I think that's going to be the key to the success there. Now, how crowded? I also liked all the green area I saw, and all the uh, landscaping, uh, and then. Worst case scenario, I look at it now, no place to go but up. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Thank you. Name. Good evening. Bruce Hall. I'm a landscape architect with Catalyst Design Group uh, over in Orlando. Probably the best example would be Winter Park Village. And Winter Park Village was a project that uh, what my business partner worked on many years ago. It was a similar condition of mall. They came in there, they kept some of the big boxes for the theater, tore everything out, um, and then created really an urban village because they do have the residential components. They've, they have a variety of restaurants. We actually work two blocks from there and we walk over there for lunch or you know, dinner, or whatever, have meetings on the site. Uh, so it probably embraces the urban village and really having the residential component is, I think that becomes key to the commercial side because now you're expand, extending that lifespan into the evenings and on the weekends too. So um, I, I hope we see our seniors going down for coffee, going for you know breakfast and lunch downtown or downstairs just as much. Um, but I, I believe we're still maintaining the ground floor retail underneath the residential. And then we have the garage underneath the uh, building G southern portion um you know as, as jesse said it's been um uh, it's been a nice experience going through this with the city staff and working and further illustrating our open space and our desires because we do have the residential component on it we also need to have the amenities so it is a little different where um, a little bit than Titus Landing, where we want to have little quiet areas of respite, where there's shade, there's picnic tables, there's benches, there's places to get away. Those work equally well for the business uh, staff and employees to uh, take a break as well. Um, 
certainly through our discussions, we've more clearly defined not only in photographs, but also our open space with the festival street, which again, we, we see that as being uh, hopefully a curbless street. And so that it, you know, from building face to building face, it's flush. Um, that becomes really kind of the, the uh, one of the centerpieces, but on a day to, for special events, but on a day to day basis, out on Hopkins, we have um, really a street front, little plazas established over there, um, which will be activated uh, you know, by uh, the residents as well as the uh, great people watching place with the cars going by. Yeah, over by Building A, there's a small plaza in there right off of a rain garden, so as, um, as Roddy had mentioned. So for all nights to be presenting, following up on LE, LID, right, right. It's, it's perfect. Because not only does LID give us the opportunity to improve the water quality, it also gives us oftentimes a more effective use of that space. You know, we, we can do more creative designs that help with the, uh, the infiltration of the water and also just from the stormwater conveyance. A lot of times, you know, if you're moving water from one end of the area to the other, if you do it through a pipe, you know, you've got that maintenance on it, you don't see what's going on. If we can do it in the uh, dry swales, now that water is being treated through either the vegetation that's out there or just perking into the ground, but it's slowly getting a treatment process. Um, and we've, we've worked on a number of those projects, uh, fortunately, that. It, um, that have also received funding on the public sector from the water management district. So those, um, you know, we, we certainly have the experience on that. The Paseos, um, you know, the, the spaces in between the buildings, that's kind of the choke point. People walk through there, people have to encounter one another. It's a great place to just sit, dine, uh, relax. And those are part of our, our major east-west corridor. And then really going back to the very beginning, the, uh, the Rain Garden Plaza, over on the east end, that little triangle, that's actually the plaza area. Uh, we would look for the uh, area between it and the garden to be um, um, in vegetation and other, um, uh, other methods to make it a attractive, not just a, not just a, a bahia grass uh, swale, if you will. Um, yeah, with, with the residential component, as, as we said, we've, we've looked to amenitize wherever we could. Uh, we really don't, you know, don't have the active recreation of volleyball, basketball courts, but I'm not quite sure that that's quite as appropriate on this. But we do have the walking and jogging path that's a mile circulating through the project. Um, you know, and I think it was mentioned that we had, you know, we're also looking at public art opportunities. We've reached out to people where, yeah, maybe they can orchestrate and organize the actual displays for the project. Um, and uh, we also mentioned that the swimming pool moved a little bit further south, so it's in more of a private area uh, in that corridor. And really that open space there, once we understand the stormwater really well, then we can get into looking at how we can either increase that hardscape area or activate that, that landscape area and lots of trees. So we have to have trees. So, and... Uh, I think that's it. Member Stokel. Okay. Well, there are a lot of things I do like about this project. I will say that. My question is, have you seen this type of development that incorporates a hotel, an apartment complex, an assisted living facility in like this piece of land with a with surrounding it without being right next to another piece that's like walking and urban mixed use? Like this standalone piece fitting in Titusville, have you seen this somewhere else? With the, incorporating those three different pieces? On the, yeah, again, I would, I would really kind of go back to the Winter Park Village example because there is residential there. Um, I don't recall if there's- Which is fine, I have no problem. Living, I like the residential which, And there's single family across the street. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have the uh, multi-story uh, residential component on the site. Yeah, I think it's mixing that in then with the hotel and then it just doesn't seem like it's a cohesive piece, I guess, if that makes sense. That's, it, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the example where the hotel would be there, but the yeah. advantage to the hotel then, again, as the residential component is, it's something that activates the space 
on a longer term than just the uh, the surrounding community. Okay. I see no other questions. So next up, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Joe Rovero, uh, Director of Transportation Planning for Luke Transportation Engineering Consultants. We did the traffic study for the comprehensive plan, traffic analysis from going from a commercial high density to the mixed use uh, land use. And um, basically, when you compare to what under the comprehensive plan at the maximum amount of development that could go on that property today, and was around 950,000 square feet. Um, and you compare that to what's being proposed here, the difference in traffic is it's a reduction of 48% in terms of what this land use plan represents compared to what potentially could go on that site today based on current zoning and going at the maximum density. In addition to that, we also looked at uh, a shared parking analysis because when you go to a mixed use, you have that ability because there are times when people don't need the same parking space because if you're working there during the day, but you're living there at night, you can share a parking space. Um, and again, when you compare to what an individual land use is, if you looked at all of them individually, based on what's being proposed, we're seeing a, a, it actually represents a 52% reduction in the amount of parking spaces that would be required, which again, allows you to have more open space, more green space, and so you don't have a, a massive parking lot. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you might have regarding any of the traffic. We will, or we have done an additional traffic study, should this be approved, and we go forward and, and looking, at the, looking at the access management, we have prepared that traffic study and, and that has been submitted to the city for review once this comprehensive plan amendment gets passed. Would you have any questions? Be happy to answer. Uh, them. Member Stokel. It might be more for Peggy. Um, so how does that work? Do, have we done a traffic study or, yeah, how does that process work? The traffic study is provided to us and then we have a PhD traffic uh, engineer who reviews it and if he has any questions or issues, he even has, and I'm really sorry to say this, he has traffic models at home that he I goes to it. his home computer and makes sure that the traffic mo I know, he's a lovely person, but he really <laughs> likes traffic. Um, and so he reviews all of this, and if he sees any issues, or they, then he would communicate directly with this gentleman or one of the people in his staff. So that's how we review traffic our traffic studies. And, and we have responded to comments from them and, and, and provided additional information as they've needed it. So if we were to approve it, it would still have to go through our people and meet the criteria. That is correct. Okay. And in fact, one of the conditions that the staff has recommended is that an updated traffic study would be provided with the first site plan. Okay. And as that is needed in the future, because this is, a, in my opinion, a multi-year project and things could change we've mm -hmm. seen that before then if we feel that there's a, a need we would certainly ask for additional traffic information as the project continues okay thank you because the comprehensive traffic study looked at overall general the traffic study the secondary one would address uh, all the access points in terms of the intersections as they, as people come on to or, or leave the site where the comprehensive plan really only looks at a much broader issue and the roadways out at the horizon years for the comprehensive plan, whereas the, the other traffic study is more detailed and more uh, um, short term in terms of the analysis. Okay, I see no questions. Thank you. No more questions. Next up. Good evening. I am a very tired Cindy Mott. My address is 401 Winghurst Boulevard. I live in Orlando. I am the manager of Titusville Antique Mall. We are the 19,000 square foot old Publix building 
on the Hopkins side of the mall. We have 72 vendors. We have eight staff members. So I am here representing them. We are the third largest antique mall in Brevard County. And if Jesse gets me 20,000 and 100 square feet, we would be the second largest in Brevard County. We are just behind the two that are in Melbourne. And all my vendors and my staff, we all support this project. Our building is quite tired. It is ready to be put to rest. And this comes from a person who loves vintage and retro, but yeah. we are ready for a new building. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And I see no questions. Hi, I'm Lisa McCotter, and I live on Country Club Drive. I spoke to you last um, meeting, um, council meeting, and um, so you know I support the project. I support the project being a bit involved in it but also as um, someone in a citizen in the community and a neighbor. Um, there is a lot going on in this property, but I, I'm very excited when I see it, when I see the uh, video and look at the different plans. It's very exciting to have that within walking distance of my own home. Um, I, I feel like the um, the, the buildings with the apartments and even the senior living will um, support the property there with the different retail and then um, Cindy's Antique Mall. <laughs> um, and it just feels like a bit, it's like bringing downtown a little closer to where I am. Um, having the area it really reminds me of when on the Friday nights downtown when US-1 is closed off and the vendors are there and different types of activities. I feel like that will be the same or can be um, the same effect when that horizontal north to south um, area in the center of the property. And so that's really exciting to me. So I hope that you all will support this project, and we all know it's better and will be better than what we have right now. Amen. Thank you. Uh, uh, I need to hold um, hold on anything else. Uh, we're at 1030, so I need somebody to extend the meeting. And is there a certain amount of time we can extend to or anything? We would? It's, it's up to you. I, I would suggest 11 o'clock. So moved. Um, I've got a, for a motion by the vice mayor, a second by member Doran to extend to 11 o'clock. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed. All right, we move forward. Um, Jesse, anybody else? Yeah, here we go. See, he thought he was done an hour ago. Round two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do support this project. I've been living in tight. Oh, by the way, I'm 1703 Crossbill, Mark Frank. Uh, I've been living and working and I own a business in this Titusville for the last 17 years and we've been doing beautification through signs and stuff like that so I've been working actually talking with Jesse for the last three years on this and I'm starting to see the future that you're talking about and you are talking about for this community uh, I love Titusville Titusville is beautiful nice peaceful great place to live it's got an eyesore. That eyesore is Titusville Mall right now. We had one before, and uh, Robin Fisher put together and got that tore down and got Titusville involved, and now we had Titus Landing. So I believe this is going to complement it much more. It'll actually bring in businesses for both of these places. Uh, you have people that are going to be uh, residents there, and they're going to go travel all through the city. They're not going to just hang there. Um, and you're talking 800 people. That's not a lot of people for that area. Uh, Tampa, uh, uh, in a request you said about who's doing this, Tampa has one downtown on the riverfront. They're doing the same thing. They have uh, apartment, senior living, medical, and residential, and also uh, retail. So they are done elsewhere. I've seen it in Jacksonville. Uh, I've seen it in different cities that we've put signs up in all over the uh, state of Florida. So 
I hope you all really support it because we do need something new in this town. And we're already on that growth anyway. If you look at US-1 in that area where Titus Landing is, they've turned down the old Pineapple Bay now. Yay. And the banks and everything going in uh, over on Barna and uh, uh, Cheney. So this is something that we really all need. So there's tweaking that could be done. Tweak? Yes. But I tell you what, I think it's one of the best things that's come to this town in a long time, especially jobs and, and the beautification of this town, too. I agree. Okay. Um, well, thank any, you very any much. Any questions? I see none. One of my challenges has been to be able to satisfy everyone. We have about 24 tenants at the location. So it's not an easy job to do this, to cut them all and do it in phases and relocate tenants from one point to another and so on. A similar project that uh, Mark was talking about is uh, Midtown Tampa. I've visited the site. It has the same exact ingredients and components. And uh, the other thing is, you know, since Sears has left three years ago, I've made promises to tenants that we will have the Sears retrofitted. That didn't work out. It's been three years. If you can imagine, if you're a business owner within them all, with the COVID, with the crisis we're going through right now, how they do business, is difficult. So with this project, they get to actually go to a new location and be able to carry on. There's tenants there that have been there for 20 to 40 years. And so they would be able to go into a new place, much more dense. I totally agree with you. It is a dense project. This isn't no Titus landing where you can shoot the cannon. I mean, I hate to say this, but you may not probably hit anyone. We're not really doing another Titus landing. Titus landing is an eight-year-old project started 2012 or 2014, I, I believe. We're in 2021. We should be ready for newer things. With that, I have nothing else to, to add, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I have a couple questions. One is, assuming things move forward tonight, what's, what's the time frame to start? Would you start moving? Well, as I discussed earlier, uh, Mr. Mayor, we still have to go through conditional use permit for the height. Uh, we have a vacation portion for the uh, utilities in the south portion of the property that is coming up on November 17th and 23rd. Uh, and then we have the variance in the signs with that guy sitting over there to do the signage. And then we can, uh, I can be on that bulldozer to take out the Sears Mall. I mean, uh, that's, the, that's the intention. So I would say probably, I hope to be on that bulldozer by mid-summer next year. Sooner the better. And if you get, when you get started, um, if you get started, um, if you decide somewhere along the line, maybe to member Stokel's point, that maybe we don't need this, we don't, is there some fluidity in this as you go, since you're doing it in sections? Could you say, you know what, I really, you know what, I like this, but I, I don't think that's gonna fit like I thought it would. Well, you know, I've gotta be very honest with you. We've actually done a similar uh, concept earlier where we actually had the commercial portion facing US-1. I could not get any lender to support that. I have two lenders, I have the financing already approved, the way this looks. And you can imagine, I'm not asking the city for any money, you know, it's not six and a half million that the city paid to Titus Landing, and this is twice as big as the size of the budget for Titus Landing. So if things are gonna be changed, I'm not sure how am I gonna be able to approve the lender. And these okay. are not the good time to put a hotel project in a, in a pandemic where you get a mortgage for the hotel and a mixed, mixed zone. But I can assure you this, if I have the approval of everyone in the city council, we will do this project 100%. And I discussed this with Peggy and Brad that uh, we're not gonna stop at the resi, we're not gonna stop at the hotel, we'll do the entire project completely. And we've counted every single dollar that comes from the property to be able to debt service the, uh, the mortgages. Very good, any other questions? I see none. Uh, thank you. Uh, city uh, Clerk, I'm getting tired here. So, uh, clerk, we getting more cards? Um, we do, but I think some of them may have left. Um, we have Kathy Laws. Everybody's 
Okay. Well, one hasn't. Um, William Cassell, I think he's left. And then we have Stan Johnston, and that's the last one. Stan, wake up. <laughs> no, he's not. He's, he's angry. Uh, Stan Johnston, I'm not opposed to this project. I spoke on this before. But uh, Mr. Wright doesn't know that that uh, before he came here is that there's a number of times I've been here 50 years is is that uh, the city has uh, bragged and boasted that it's a low rise community. And you look at some other communities in this area like Cocoa and Rockledge, and they they have that same low rise area. Now, uh, when you get to thir over 35 feet, you're you're getting pretty high. And when you get 60 and 75 feet or 90 feet or something like that, you're up to where I object to that. And uh, I'm not sure where it, how it happened, but we're, we are, uh, we got this new high rise coming in at the uh, north end of town now, which I was very much against. And now we're having another one that looks like, I don't know, I went over to Winter Park, I don't remember seeing anything like this. 75 and 60 feet buildings right up against each other. I haven't seen that. But maybe it's there, because uh, I haven't been there recently. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm not. I'm against the uh, the height. Uh, I, I like. I want. I want this to be a low-rise community, and uh, uh, that's what it's been promoted for years, um, bef long before Mr. Wright came here. So uh, that's that's the objection that I have. Is is that. Uh, um, uh, I just uh, I just think like when when these buildings came over there near Sandpoint Park, I man, that was going to be great. That's going to be great. But then when I get up and I go down Garden Street, which I've been going down there for years, I look, the sky's gone. Oh my God, what happened to the sky? I mean, I used to look like over 100 miles. I mean, uh, there's times I've been in in the, the land and I've seen the shuttle go off, and I've been over in Clearwater and get on a building and I could see the shuttle go off. But now, my God, we got. It blocks the sky, and also my my mother. What she what she do? Uh, she was in her seventies or eighties, and she'd still be going in our in the pool. She she goes skinny dipping, and you know that that, <laughs> take, that takes it out. You know. <laughs> well, it was privacy over there, so so uh, that that eliminates a lot of this uh, uh, for some people. For some people, uh, for some people, instead of going to the beach again. So anyhow. So um, that's that's all I have. To, so uh, for those skinny dippers, they can move another place. Thank you. Okay, Member Jordan, Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve comprehensive plan amendment application number one dash twenty twenty Titusville Mall. I have a Mayor, motion. Mayor, we'll need to vote on each ordinance separately. Okay, Member Jordan, get to work. <laughs> My God, oh, turn as sleepy as I. <laughs> Let's turn the clock off there, the clerk. Um, so the, looks like the application 1-2020 and ordinance number 28-2021 and ordinance number 20. Oh, we need to do 27 first. 27 is the first. I am sleepy here. I am too. Jeez. All right. So ordinance number 27-2021, can we do it collectively? Just one Separate at a time? Yes. All right. That's all I have to say for that one. Okay, we have the motion by Member Jordan. I have a second by Vice Mayor. Roll call vote. Discussion? Uh, yes. Go. Um, <laughs> this question's for Ms. Busaka. So there's, I, I definitely want this piece developed. I, it's one of our worst pieces, I feel like, in this town. Um, I know you had some concerns on, from the staff side of things. What are our options? moving forward if we do want the project to go through, but there's a couple things that we might want tweaked prior. Well, I think that probably what you're concerned about is the master plan. Yes. And so the, Matt, the urban village zoning is required by the master, is required to have a master plan. Which I think I'm okay with the, I think the first one, the land use change. The land use change. I, I'm okay with that. Yes. yes. And then the, um, and then the, Next one would be the actual change to the element itself, which it's that seems like you you might be okay with that maximum amount of um, commercial and I'm sorry non residential and residential the floor area ratio and then the maximum yes, density. Yes. 
So then what I would suggest is if you had concerns about the master plan, it would probably be best for the applicant if it were not denied, but if it were tabled that because if it's denied, then he has to wait a while to come back so that then you could express what your concerns were. They give him an opportunity to work on that and bring it back. Yes. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm okay with the first two. I would prefer for the third one to be tabled just to get some of those things addressed. Um, but that's kind of where I'm at. I would do not want to deny it. I don't want to, but that just before we go into voting, that's kind of where I'm at moving forward. Okay. Clear. We're yeah. just on the first one. On first. I know. I just wanted to clarify for discussion. Right. I have a motion. I have a second. Discussion's over. Roll call vote. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve ordinance number 28-2021. I have a motion. Second. I have a second from Member Stokel. Roll call vote. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, let's see how this one goes. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve ordinance number 29-2021. I have a motion from Member Jordan, Mr. a second from Vice Mayor. Mr. Jordan, does that include the conditions? Yes. I think staff has nine, yes. possibly nine conditions. Yes. Staff yes. It includes conditions. I have a motion. I still have a second. Roll call vote. Member Stokel? No. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Motion passes four to one. And I believe that's it. That's it. Member Robinson, you have a question? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just want, that's fine. Okay, so all three have passed two unanimously, one four to one. And I believe that is the business of the day. There you go. Yeah. You guys hang around. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good presentation. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to it. Give them just one second here. One minute. <laughs> We better get this next thing down to Thank you guys. Thank you so much. All right, city manager. Yes, sir. Uh, this is comprehensive uh, plan uh, 2 2021 property rights element. This is the first reading for ordinance 32 2021. Uh, the the uh, second reading and public hearing is scheduled to be considered by city council on November 9th, 2021. The Planning and Zoning Commission, acting as your local planning agency, considered this plan amendment on October 20th and recommended approval 7-0. And the um, city attorney will read the ordinance. First reading only. Ordinance number 32-2021, an ordinance of the city of Titusville, Florida, amending the code of ordinances by amending ordinance number 60-1988, which adopted the comprehensive plan of the city of Titusville by adopting comprehensive plan amendment 2-2021 adding a property rights element, including goals, objectives, and policies relating to property rights into the comprehensive plan, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Okay, what's first reading? Are there any cards on this? Stan Johnston. Uh, Stan Johnston, 860 Poinsett Avenue. I am for this with reservations. And uh, my handouts uh, apply to this. In other words, the pink card, the uh, uh, pictures of uh, uh, my car, and all so forth like that, and the um, uh, email that I sent you today uh, that refers to, for this, the comp plan refers to number six, number eight, 13 through 16, and 18 through 21. And the pink card says something like this. It says, in the four-way test, it says, the first thing it says, is it the truth? 
Well, in this particular case, when I, I submitted this in 2016, what happened was is that it says this is the truth. The flood map does not show the dams, consider the, the calculation, so forth like this. This was submitted before Baker's subdivision was shown to be incorrect flood zone. This is what I printed out. So this was for it and predicted saying, hey, you know, it's going to be wrong what we have on the flood zone map. And we do. The fact is that they, there's no calculations at all. No calculations at all for that flood zone. That's illegal. No engineering and so forth like that. So what we have, we have a comp plan that is what can be called OPB. OPB, that's uh, outrageous, phony, baloney. I mean, you may call me OCD, but I'm talking about OPB. And that's what we have here because, and let me read to you number 18 that I sent to you. Number 18 says, out-of-date comprehensive plan based on outdated area of critical concern mapping, which is number, then number 14, erroneous flood zones, which I just explained to you with this, that's number six, approximate wetland mapping rather than actual surveyed wetland boundaries. Nowadays, you, in other words, if you want to know what you want to do with your property, you got to have it surveyed. Zoning is not enough. And that's what's happened to a number of people. Uh, uh, open recreation or OR zoning ridiculously mapped, and I've been told it's illegally mapped, in 1993 by use of the soil map, the soil survey of Brevard County. That still applies to the city of Titusville. So we're having, we're having uh, what I'm talking about is the city's comprehensive plan, which, which a number of things I'm telling you about, a number of things are outdated and, and are not correct, like the flood zone map, is it is OPB. That is outrageous, phony, baloney. And that's where we're going on. So uh, uh, I'm also for approving of this. Thank you. OPB. <laughs> Wow. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so, that's a first reading, right? Yes, sir. No. No. OPB required. threw me off, man. Okay. City manager. We have no old business. Uh, we have three new business items. The first one is the uh, Titusville Environmental Commission recommendations relating to the Titusville Landscape Gateway and Signing con Concept Plan. During the July 27th, 2021 regular city council meeting, the council supported the landscape gateway concept plan and supported soliciting feedback from the T Titusville Environmental Commission. During the October 13th regular TEC meeting, the commission recommended approval of the Titusville uh, landscape gateway signage concept plan with two conditions. Number one, that all proposed date palms be replaced with native palms. That vote was 4-0 and two, that no more than 50% of the current balance of the public uh, landscape trust fund be used for the implementation of this plan. That was approved 3-1. Staff is recommending to council that we receive your recommendation and provide direction to staff on how to proceed with your, cons or your gateway project. Staff, any presentation? No presentations after 10.30, huh? <laughs> um, Council, you want to go ahead. Um, council, uh, Member Stokel. Um, do you have any information on the difference between a date palm and a native palm and why that was made and pros and cons potentially to that? I can, I can read the minutes. I was looking to see if Ms. Thompson is here since okay. she was at the meeting. Would that be more helpful? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just kind of curious about that. But I feel like there's an environmental concern, and then there's also traffic concerns, safety, and other things. So I just kind of would like to hear that side, I guess. Hi, uh, Laura Lee Thompson, 3550 Irwin Avenue. I believe the intent of the community or the committee was for all exotic palms, not just date palms. Um, but I, I use date palms as an example because if you um, go over and drive on I-4 at the Disney exits now, um, like by celebration, the, it's lined with date palms. They were gorgeous. 
they all look like folded down umbrellas now. They're all dead. And so there's something going on that's killing date palms. And I saw it in Sun Tree when I was down in Vieira um, a couple days ago. Also, um, they're at the entrance to, you know, I think it was on Bay Tree going to um, CPI. The, the date palms are all dead. The, the fronds are like this. And, and, and all the trees in a row. So there's something going on. And as climate change keeps ramping up, um, disease and, and pests are going to become more and more prevalent at, in the warming atmosphere. And so our concern was that the use of sable palms in the project would be better than trying to use exotic palms. And so maybe that's why date palms got slipped into the motion. I think the motion was to, our intent was to use native sable palms, Florida sable palms, rather than um, exotic non-native palms. Because yeah. you just waste your money. Yeah. If they're going to die, why, why spend the money on them? If they're, they're going to, they also require more water more fertilizer, you know, more upkeep where the sable palms, once you put them in the ground and get them going, then they're going to grow on their own. Okay, okay. thank you so much for that. Uh, Vice Mayor? Ah, in that case, I don't see why we don't trade the palm trees out. We go for the natives, they're probably uh, cheaper also. <laughs> <laughs> This is past yeah. the buck. <laughs> we can, whatever you guys decide, we can we can pass that on to the, the consultant to to switch out yep. certain trees. Yeah, date palm. I believe they're on the Florida friendly list, but they're not Florida native. Okay, so that we, I like that idea. I don't know what we got to do to make our, that happen. Everybody, but just okay, just okay. correct us. At least three right there. Okay, <laughs> that's advisability. Uh, Member Robinson. Yeah, I just say, you know, if, uh, I don't know that much about trees and, and, and so forth, and my my uh, my thoughts on it, get someone to know about trees, plant the right one out there, and let's move forward. <laughs> there, you go. there he goes. Okay, so uh, call the cards, please. Okay, say long. Yes, Case St. Ange, Maryland Avenue, Titusville, thank you. Um, consider using the landscape trust funds for urban forestry projects rather than spending the majority of this $422,000 fund on these landscape concept plans. Remember, these revenues are received as a result of tree mitigation efforts when developers choose to pay for trees they remove rather than replace them. The funds, $422,000 as of July, represent the loss of thousands of trees removed without replacement since 2001. The city is moving forward with an urban forestry program defined as the care and planting of trees on public property. September 14, council approved application for an urban forestry grant for a tree canopy assessment to help the city create an urban forestry management plan. Some might remember that in 2013, the city paid a consultant for an urban forest master plan and street tree inventory, the consultant recommended the city should embark on a citywide tree planting campaign. However, this never went forward. The Tree City USA requires qualifying communities have a community forestry program that provides for the care and planting of city trees. On the Tree City USA application for 2021, the city indicates that it planted 28 trees. And only four in 2020. That's quite a tree planting campaign. Embark on a citywide tree planting campaign to replace tree canopy lost 
to development. I believe the city can improve upon 28 trees being planted or four in another year. Consider a phase two of tree plantings at Sandpoint Park between the exercise trail and the lagoon. North Brevard Parks and Recreation has indicated an interest in a second phase of plantings along this trail. Trees planted here would shade the trail while stabilizing the shoreline and reducing pollutants into the lagoon that we're all so very concerned about. Yes, next consider a free street tree pro uh, program similar to the 2017 anniversary tree planting program that gave away 150 trees. The street inventory of 2013 indicated 2,000 street trees are missing and are needed. Consider an urban forestry projects for this $422,000. It's time to start replacing trees lost through development. It's time to plant trees to benefit the residents and reduce the temperatures and to reduce pollutants into the lagoon. Consider urban forestry. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, she's always on three. I'm telling you, she's unbelievable. <laughs> Um, have we got anybody over there that can give me an idea on uh, uh, on tree? Because uh, it feels like there's some plan. I, I did speak with Jeff Davis the other day, and I know he was talking to me about some trees. Do we have any plans for trees down the road? Or um, yeah, I know that we had talked one time. Are, 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 are you talking about your gateway project? Well, no, not so much the gateway okay. project. I'm talking about overall, any trees, because uh, I know that we had done some things over there at uh, Sandpoint Park, and um, and that's, I, I think that was the last thing we did, which wasn't that long ago. So. Yeah, that was the last thing we did. We don't have any funded projects. For okay. Um, Vice Mayor Nelson. I, I would sort of like to see us make sure that we don't spend all of the money on the gateway project and when i was looking at the urban forestry um, pamphlet i guess i'm going to call it um, this is apparently the first phase and after this we can apply for a second grant and it's a matching grant and they'll pay 50 percent for planting trees so if we all blow all our money on the gateways which are going to look gorgeous then every time I walk Sandpoint Park, I'm going to still be dying of heat in July. So I would like to see a sort of balance this a little bit. That's just my thought. Remember, Jordan? I, I was going to say something smart, but I seen but you had a second thing about it. But I had a second thing about it, yeah, because I'm sleepy. Um, we've got a budget for the Gateway Project, right? You, you, right now, you, what you did is you prioritized out of the overall project right. of $1.3 million, you, right. you prioritized what we currently have in the trust fund, right. which is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars my, my suggestion is that we finish the project and the next go around, then we can do what you, you're talking about. But I don't want to see a project start and not complete it. And to me, this is an introduction to Titusville. So you need to complete the thing. We've all agreed that what we have now coming into town is not nice. So I think we should do that. I, I understand. You know, I, I got to say this, and God forgive me for saying this, but I'm tired, and I'm going to say it anyhow. When I go down 405, uh, 405 and South Street, yeah. 405 yeah. and South Street, yeah. all I see is trees, right? So what we're talking about is just putting tree here and tree there. And what we need to do is visualize what we want people to see when they walk they come into this town and to me those trees that we're going to plant in those different areas is going to be a good introduction to our city uh, after that I, I'm in agreement uh, for the tree trust fund we should utilize it to do some of the things that you're talking about in the park and stuff like that and Time out before we go any further. I need a 15-minute extension. Uh, I'm not going to give it to you. Okay. I'll give it to you. Uh, I have a 15-minute extension from Vice Mayor. I need a second. Folks, we, we go home. <laughs> we can go home. We don't have to do this. I need, did you say yes? Yeah. All right. I've got a motion and a second. All those in favor I say yes. I want to get it done so it works. Yes. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. Stop. <laughs> 
All right, you can go home. No, I go home. No. Oh, <laughs> all right, uh, Member home. Robinson. Yes, uh, I mean one of the, when I uh, a year ago when I started this uh, this journey, <clears throat> uh, few of them, the first ten phone calls that I received and I contacted the city manager was about the ugliness of entering Titusville. So let's go on and beautify that. And, and uh, yes, you can always, the one thing that I see people do that that's uh, because you get, you make a decision and you, everybody does not agree with that decision, doesn't make it a wrong decision. You know, it, 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 it doesn't make, because, yeah, well, if you had the opportunity, you would make it one way. And as, but it, as long as you're trying to do the best for the whole, that's the purpose of this. And let us, let us we, we decided we were going to uh, uh, do this, go forth, make it happen, and stop being wishy-washy every other two weeks. Uh, and, and I appreciate that. I will say, I don't, well, maybe I did. I don't know. I'm not, in my case, I'm not wishy-washy. I will tell you that back in 16 when I got on board here, one of the first things I heard, too, was the gateways. And uh, having lived here since 1965, um, I can, and I pay a lot of attention to that stuff more than I used to. You know, when I go by in, into Coco on a daily basis and I see their entryways, some some of the signs don't have to be real big, but they're, they're colorful, they're pretty. Um, Rockledge has a big old concrete deal. Um, so I think we had kind of made a decision in, in, in on our uh, our plan that one of the things we need to do was uh, work on our entryways, the first impression. You get one shot at it. And even if it's not a first impression, you want to be proud when you come home to your place. I I tend to be proud of this place no matter what. So if it's, you know, not the perfect entryway, but there are a lot of people who will, like I said, it's one of the first things I heard as well. But that to say we want more trees, uh, like you guys are saying the same thing, we have a lot of mitigation coming up, it would be my guess, due to the fact that there's plenty of activity going on. I think that we just, you know, make the priority, uh, you know, from that, okay, so we got the the gateways in, you know, so now we don't have to worry about that. Let's let's throw the rest of the trees and not just, you know, part of it, all of it. And, so. and, and uh, as I recall during the budget process, one of the items that council was considering was the white uh, light project that we have that's been right, for, right. for probably 15 years right. at uh, 2.5 million dollars the, the first phase that you were considering was 750,000 so again that's on the the 14 million dollar deferred maintenance list that we have currently yeah. so just as a reminder I think that's what I heard during the budget is that will creep in to be one of your priorities absolutely and, and I'm not moving away from that I, I, I agree with member Robinson you, you can't be up here and get everyone right for that one person, one, whatever. But I will say that, you know, trees are important, but the gateway has been a, a big deal for at least six years. And we keep talking about doing it. Now we've, we've made a move to do it. I don't want to leave that move behind. Uh, Vice Mayor. And I can live with that. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, we're not going to get our tree assessment back for a little bit. I would say probably several months. I'm, I'm on guess, but at some point, um, if we find a little bit in the bu budget, it would be nice to have that, to ask for a grant, hopefully match it, um, make some of the areas that are a little bit overly warm in the city, a little bit more comfortable for those of us that want to walk them. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. Um, did you say that the entryway the signs have been up since 65? No, 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 no. I've been here since 65. When I got here, there were no street lights, and that's the truth. How, and, and you guys might remember this. I know you do. Highway 50 was narrow and no street lights. Sisson Road was a holy, um, not not uh, religiously either, but it was a, was a holy dirt road. Uh, we played Little League at Coquina Elementary School. So, you know, I, I get that. And there's plenty of trees then, too. And so there's, we, so that's where we're at. Um, any other things there? Cards? Kathleen Perez. Sorry. 
Kathleen Perez, I live at 3025 South Washington Avenue in Titusville. This is really low. It's falling. Um, okay. Tired. So I, I was not even really aware as a citizen of Titusville until very recently that that the city was allowed to raid the mitigation fund and just use it for something that it wasn't intended for it, which is what I'm hearing now, that the, develop, the developers pay into the mitigation fund because it's supposed to, I assume, mitigate the destruction to the environment. Isn't, is, is that correct? City Attorney, could you um, pull that uh, up yesterday? I went through that discussion yesterday, and okay. I, I can tell you the bottom line is it's for the beautification of the city, and there are some okay. lines in there. City Manager and City Attorney, can you go over that real quick? Correct. It's Resolution 30-2001, and in the recitals it references the, the city desire to beautify public properties by landscaping said properties. And all funds received in accordance with Section 35.4 of the Land Development Regulations shall be used to beautify publicly owned or publicly maintained property. So, yes, it's to be used for landscaping. That's correct. Landscaping. For, okay. Not for signage, Not to mitigate the, the destruction. Not for other to, things other than. Okay. No, that, that, that is, in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't mean that it's not also able to mitigate tree loss. I think that's right. really a main but factor. It, but it's not but in it's, this case. We're using it for. Well, in, in, in fairness, you, you used the term rated the fund when, in yeah. fact, he just read the rule book. No, I, okay, I get that. And I stand corrected. You're, I mean, I, I assumed, and I think a lot of other people did, that when you're allowing people to clear cut and do the things they're doing and they're paying into the mitigation fund because they've removed some many trees that the purpose of the fund was to fix that destruction to put trees in to replace those trees so I was wrong about that and I wonder how many citizens are wrong about that I think a lot of us thought that was the purpose of it well otherwise part of why would we, I think that's yeah, part of the reading as well it, yeah well Okay, it doesn't. It really doesn't make too much sense. From a, I, I get that that's the rule. It doesn't make too much sense from a logical standpoint that people would assume. Well, this could be just for any planting. Like we could plant a bunch of non-natives that would require chemicals and pollute even more. Um, and then what concrete, I guess. And I know that you guys all have said, well, it's embarrassing. This is what people first see. Well, we we already live here. We want trees. We know where we live. I don't need a new sign. I, I would love to have some trees on the bicycle path. It is so freaking hot there. So you know what? None of us use it. We all go to Volusia, where the bike path is shaded on both sides. It's way, way more comfortable. I guess that's right. it. Thank you. That next card. Tony Shefalo. Tony Shippolo, 715 Tropic Street. I had a paper I was going to read, but um, now I'm just going to say, you are so correct about needing trees for shade, for the citizens, for the residents. That's what the mitigation fund should be. You take out a tree, you pay for it, you put another tree. Um, I drive in and out of Titusville from all directions quite often. I see the signs, nature, space. Mm, um, a couple of plants there. Why are you going to spend four hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars of the mitigation fee for planting some of those palm trees, which Member Jordan says are just trash trees anyway? Who cares about palm trees? Do you remember saying that um, at some of the tree team uh, presentations? Yeah. Anyway, why spend that money to do that when you could? It could be done so much cheaper scrap these plans that this company without even without even putting out bids to get the gateway project you're going to let this one company i guess they're in orlando um come over and plant some palm trees and put some shrubs in and charge us four hundred forty three thousand dollars and the people on the bike path and walking in sandpoint park and are going to just have to do without shade without any trees um it just seems pointless to me. I agree you want to have a nice entryway. You want to have something attractive. I don't think we need to be spending the mitigation fees for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next card. 
<clears throat> the last card is Susan Canada. Susan Canada, 2299 Heritage Drive, and I'm kind of sleepy. I'm stage four cancer, and I got a blood clot mm. from my ankle into my abdomen, and I've been sitting here for a long time. So I want you to listen to me and stay awake, because I'm going to probably fall asleep. Okay, now, my three minutes starts now, hopefully. There's a way to do this for everybody where everybody can get what they want. I can't walk at Sandpoint Park or anywhere because it's too hot, so I'm stuck going in stores, walking around and around and around board stiff. You need more trees in these parks, but by the same time, you want a sign. You just had a sign maker here. I imagine he'd do it for a lot less than 400,000 put signs around the city. It would leave money for trees and for the signs. But to go and use a no-bid contractor, right now it says here, no-bid contracts hurt competitive bidding process and lead to wasteful and inefficient use of public funds. Many agencies know that no-bid contracts can hurt the bidding process instead of helping them as well as decrease chances for startups and small businesses to win contracts as the government um, uses these no-bid contracts. Also, it prevents the competitive bidding process. The number of bidders who can bid on government contracts gets reduced, which means agencies might not get a fair value price for the service or product they purchase. Also, it makes you wonder about transparency where you have a no bid agency you're working with. And it seems a contradiction of terms, other than the name actually a sole source contract sums it up even more. It's where in a contract only one company is being considered to contract to undertake work. This usually happens when there's only one company that's available to undertake the work. You just had a sign maker sitting right here in the front row holding up signs for the one gentleman with the developers. And no bid contracts are sometimes controversial and should be used sparingly. They're common when there are legal or security reasons why negotiations with only one company should be undertaken. I don't think this qualifies for that. Also, there's a need for great speed. I don't think we have that. Or it's the sole or single source contracts are much faster to negotiate and work in a conventional bidding environment, which may take many months to complete. It's in the public interest. An example would be such as a bank needed to be sold or bailed out. We don't have any of that with this. But you've got a company right now where this leads me to wonder, why do you have a sole bid contractor where you're not getting other prices where it may give you money to have both groups satisfied? Plus, it leads you to wonder, why do you have a sole bid contractor? What employee is behind this? And if I could have just two more minutes. I checked out the company. We don't just do that. Um, how about one minute? Yeah, we'll go one minute. Let's go one minute. I'd uh, like two. I'd like three minutes for my. I can't. I can't hear you. Okay. Um, so here we go. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to extend. So uh, I need. Uh, I'm going to say ten more minutes. We're going to be done. Okay. Ten more minutes. Second. All in favor? Yes. 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 Um, and. Um, Robert one Jordan. More minute. We're going to straighten you minute. up yet. One more minute. That's three. Okay, go. You got one minute. Okay. Right now, the company you're working with, their pricing rank, according to um, comparability, they rank fifth in customer ser or excuse me, they rank fifth in customer service. There's four ahead of them that are much cheaper, and their prices are cheaper. Also, as far as women in leadership there, it's a 3.9 as far as the executive team um, or leadership opportunities. And there's more on it than that. But you chose an expensive company to do this, one company, no bid. Why don't you do, please, both parties? And I'm sure that um, Reverend Robinson can tell you that's the way to go. Put this out to bid. You've got sign makers. Let's get them in here, and let's get the trees. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Busaka. Could you please respond to that, please? I have an email that was written on October 11th from April Chapman. She's our purchasing manager. 
it says uh, Kimberly Horn was not given a sole source, no bid contract. The firm was awarded a contract based on a formal solicitation request for qualifications. And the code 115 landscape architect is one of the specialties that they were evaluated and awarded. The contract states the consultant will provide engineering services and such other related services as defined in specific work orders, which will be approved by the city. Two work orders have been issued on June 9th, 2020, for one was for nine sites for $29,959. And on September 8th, 2021, State Road 406 work $25,180, which were approved and signed by the city manager, which is in accordance with the purchasing manual section three and signing threshold authority of under $50,000 for purchase orders, work orders and amendments. So there, it was not a no-bid contract? That is correct. Thank you. They're also not going to do the construction. This is just for the design and the plans. The construction will go up to, to bid installation at that point when these, when these are complete. So that's going to be bid as well? Yes. Thank you. Next card, please. Um, Stan Johnston. Yeah, uh, Stan Johnston. I wasn't going to speak on this, but, but uh, when they talked about Sandpoint Park, uh, uh, I had an experience that... Uh, uh, they had a time that, that uh, you, could, you could plant a tree at Sandpoint Park for $25, and you donate it to somebody. And so we donated one to a fellow named John Winger, and, uh, who had passed away, and I was Magnolia, and, and then I did one for my dad, and I think we did another one. And then the one from John Winger disappeared, and I don't know what happened to my dad's tree, but uh, so that's what we have right now is we're planting trees, and I don't know what happened to them. So uh, I just want to share that with you, and I'm sympathetic with what Mrs. Canada had to say. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> oh, thank you, Stan. That's very, very thoughtful. Any other cards? All right, um, and I, I do want to make it clear that this gateway, we're not, we're talking about signs. There's so much more to this than signs. I'm looking for some serious landscaping with perhaps some trees, but uh, landscaping is the key there, along with uh, some north says this is Titusville. Um, that being said, um, we can move forward here, uh, Council. Any comments and, and Council, any motions? Is this all first? Is this all first reading? Is, is this recommendation or what do we got here? Yeah, I, th I think we have enough. Do you want us to look at palm trees okay. and adjust that and then leave the project? I on? definitely, uh, with the information we just got on the palm trees, sounds like it would be crazy. So, um, well, then we go to what? On to uh, 12B, which is... Um, a related subject that city attorney just read, but uh, we want uh, council to receive a recommendation and provide direction to staff. During the October 13th regular TEC meeting, the commission approved recommendation 4-0 that the city council amend the city's public land trust resolution 30-2001 to require at least 50% of the public landscape uh, fund revenues to be used specifically for the purchase and installation of the highest quality canopy hardwood trees only, which does not include the purchase and installation of other veg vegetation. Um, so we'll just need your guidance if you want to do it. And I'm sorry, I, I was told um, previously in the meeting that from two people, one person who was at the meeting, one person who listened to the tape, that the word hardwood probably should not have been in that motion. And I think that is an error that the staff may have made from these minutes that we have our draft. So um, in the event that the council directs us to move forward, we'll confirm. And of course, it would have to come back to you anyway, but I understand it. It should just be canopy trees. Member Robinson. Yes, I, I think that this is pretty much being driven by the last one that we just approved. And uh, if, if it wants to, if we want some consideration, I have the, um, the resolution about uh, what we do with the mitigation and, and fund and so forth. Maybe one day after the, we get this done, we can come back and 
look at it again and then and and reset it up. It's just a resolution. We can set it up where and I, I, I don't disagree. I think this is a good plan to what the TEC is recommending that you that uh, in 50% uh, uh, of the uh, dollars go for you know for the I agree. Of tree yeah. and that but let's go on with what the direction that we're going on in now because that's the resolution that uh, it came up in but we can come back and make another resolution that as we go forward we do it uh, uh, with 50 percent that would be my recommendation on that. that would go that direction as well I would agree <laughs> you, you, I'm being not, agreeable uh, that's three of us agree. And uh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we're just seeing if we got enough there. Sarah, it's, Sarah say anything? Yeah. Okay, call the card. Um, Kathleen Perez. <laughs> no? I think it's the same. Okay. Um, Tony Shuffalo. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, Susan Canada. Susan Canada, 2299 Heritage Drive. Again, very sleepy. But why don't you also, while you're doing this, direct staff to look for somewhere where you might be able to get different groups to donate trees? so that we can have something at Sandpoint and along the walking trails. It's hard for a lot of us to wait till it's dark out and then start walking everywhere. I'm, I agree with you. I agree with I you. I mean, totally. I'm walking the dog right now. It'll be about midnight. And so, no, you better not. <laughs> no choice. But, um, but I have to wait till it's cooler out, and so do a lot of others that I meet at the different cancer centers because it's too hot along the trails and it's too hot at the parks. So why don't we check if maybe the men's garden club and some of the other clubs won't donate trees? And I know that we've done some of that. I know that we've got some people sitting out there who've been responsible for getting some donations. I know that I've talked to Miss Kay and then uh, Mike Myjack when he's back. Um, and I know that I talked to Jeff Davis with Parks and Rec and even city manager. So we have rolled that way some. And, and then when Stan just talked a little bit about how uh, – it kind of had me thinking how people could plant a tree for $25 and it'd be in the honor of somebody. I'm not sure how that all worked, That's but I think I'm going to talk to Jeff Davis and see if they have some kind of uh, program in line for that. Because it really doesn't matter where the trees come from as long as, well, make as long as you're not stealing them. But uh, is that, you know what I mean. If, if, if it's a donation, if it's a, uh, you bought it, I don't care. I just think if we can get some more trees up, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're, we're past that. I didn't want to say anything. Oh, we got five more minutes. That's right. Oh, oh, then, well, then this meeting's over. You have another item, 12C, that was added. I mean, we're not done. I'm, ki I'm kidding. We can't end the meeting. We can't. We're five minutes overdue. We got to extend again. Uh, we're going to really need. If we're going to be realistic, we got to go ten minutes. Uh, all right, then let's go twenty. Uh, let's, uh, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed. Okay. We're going to 1145. We're going to, we're going to get it done this time. Okay. I was kidding. I can't just end a meeting like that. But, <laughs> all right. Where were we? I'm real confused now. Card. Oh, okay. Card. Card. There we go. Okay. Say it on. Okay. We would not My leave you out. Third time to talk to you tonight. So. Kay St. Ange, Maryland Avenue, Titusville. Uh, I appreciate that TEC recognized the need to amend Resolution 30 2001 regarding the utilization of the Landscape Trust Fund going forward. Okay, I understand that besides the $422,000 that is likely to be largely appropriated by your Landscape Concept Funds and I was told that if some is left over, if you don't use it all, that it will still stay in that fund and therefore it might be utilized for other purposes. And I also understand that $33,000 of mitigation funds has accrued since July on top of that. And as the mayor says, 
more mitigation funds will be accruing. So we need to think about how to change the resolution to go forward to utilize it to indeed mitigate for trees. Um, the resolution currently says the revenues are received as a result of tree mitigation efforts. Okay, so you receive this money for tree mitigation efforts, but you don't use it for tree mitigation efforts. Mitigation means that you're reducing the damage done by cutting down these trees while well, just planting some ground uh, cover and, and a few palm trees out by the freeway it just doesn't cut it for me. I walk chain of lakes every day with a sweat rolling down me during COVID because I needed to get out of my house. <laughs> and, and other people are walking it with me and we need to provide the benefits of shade trees to the residents as street trees, to shade the streets, to shade the sidewalks, to shade the parks, the bike trails, to mitigate for the trees that are being cut down. So how can we change the resolution going forward? Well, I think council can do a better job than just saying 50% should be used for tree mitigation. I challenge you to do better than that. We need these trees to preserve the look we need the trees to reduce the heat. We need the trees to sequester the carbon. We need trees. Trees are the answer. And at this LID ordinance conference, they said that trees are the best way to reduce stormwater runoff because trees grow and they get better over time at reducing uh, stormwater runoff pollutants into the lagoon trees are the answer to the problems that we have that we need to address. And your residents will be so happy if they can walk under a shade tree, sit under a shade tree, have a park bench there. And so please consider when you do change the resolution to require more than 50%. That's just the minimum that TEC was willing to recommend to you. Thank you. And Thank please you, move Jane. forward. Thank you. Next card. Stan Johnston. Yeah. Stan Johnston, take a break. Because right, I don't have my, All right. Uh, try to be real quick here. But uh, it seems that uh, something should have been happening. The, the, the money on this fund, it should have been reported to the CTEC or, or pushed upon them to, to know what was going on. And it looks like uh, it just slipped through the cracks somehow. Um, and uh, I was uh, a few years ago, well, well, it's more than a few years ago, I got a phone call. Uh, from somebody who wanted to develop a, a restaurant over there, Quincy's. And they wanted me to survey that uh, that property. It had all these beautiful oak trees. It was just a, oh my golly. And the, the city had passed an ordinance, and I knew I was going to have to do a tree survey. And with the equipment I had, it was going to be monumental. So I just, I just told them no. So we know what happened there the tree ordinance and everything. Maybe you don't know what happened. Yeah. The clerk got it. it. Oh. Didn't do a thing. The city, the city just looked the other way. And we had the ordinance there. Just ripped it down. I'm, I'm talking about Quincy's. What, what's it called now? Some kind of a Asian seafood or something like yeah, that. But, uh, and it's just, I don't know how, the, how they did it. But uh, it was a mistake. The city admitted it was a mistake. Oh, how did they do it? I mean, we just tra passed the tree ordinance, and it was, uh, it was in other words, anyhow, so, so we're having a problem. And also, I'll, I also had somebody approach me from the men's club, garden club, and they said, uh, uh, can we get some trees from your property? And I said, sure. So at that time, they were getting, uh, men's, men's garden club was doing some free trees. But uh, uh, so I'm just sh sharing with you, there's, there's some problems involved here. And now if you look down, if you're in, if you're in Sandpoint Park and you're looking over toward at Big Apple Plaza, what tree do you see? It's a Malaluka. You believe that? In the middle of US-1, we got a Malaluka. Thank you. How about that? Is that the last card? One more, Laura Lee Thompson. Laura Lee Thompson, 3550 Irwin Avenue in Mims. 
So after a lot of discussion at our last TEC meeting, um, we voted to recommend changing the wording in the public landscape trust fund so that 50% of the funds should be used to um, prior prioritize the highest quality canopy trees in places for the public benefit. Some of the TEC members wanted 100% of the money to be used for planting canopy trees. I'm the one that pushed for the 50% split because I was trying to make everybody happy. Um, but then somebody sent me an article from South Florida where their plan is to replace their iconic palm trees with other trees. This is a huge deal, guys, because um, palm trees have been the marketing um, thing for South Florida for over 100 years. But with, with climate change, global warming, sea level rise, which is going to impact them the worst and first, um, they're trying to find other ways to slow down the in inevitable. So palm trees are the least effective trees for carbon sequestration. An average palm tree only absorbs five pounds of CO2 per year. Canopy trees can absorb and retain for the rest of their lives 400 to 600 pounds of carbon dioxide per year. So the, the resilience and climate change manager for West Palm Beach was quoted in this article. article and um, she says, palm trees don't sequester carbon at the same rate as our native canopy trees, nor do they provide shade or cool down streets and sidewalks to um, help with urban heat island effect like canopy trees do. She says, West Palm Beach gives out a thousand native trees a year for residents and businesses to plant. They have an active tree planting program, and she explains um, all about their program. The goal is to help Floridians not only beautify their surroundings, but also better plan them um, for the future for uh, global warming, man, I'm tired too. And so in order to, that, to do that, you have to be selective. Then this is the, the big thing, the big quote. We do not use our canopy tree fund to plant palm trees in Palm Beach, Redford said. Um, so after learning about the measures being taken in South Florida, I wish now that I could change my vote about our public landscape trust fund and, and side with the wiser members of the TEC who I fought with to get the 50% vote. That money was collected to mitigate for the destruction of mature canopy trees. All of it should be used to replace them with the highest quality, quality canopy trees in places for our community's public benefit. So the, the vote on the landscape plan was that no more than 50% of the current balance be used on the plan. You can still do that. You can still take 50% of the current balance, which would give you over $200,000 to make the gateways where you want to make them. Um, but then after that, I think that the money should be used on replacing canopy trees. So plant your palm trees with half the money, but but it really rightfully should be used for canopy trees. Thank That's you. That's my Morley. opinion. Thank you. I never thought palm trees would be under fire in Florida. Uh, next card. All right, that is it. Um, what do we need on this? Do we need a vote or a no? Or just a. Uh, Recommendation. It's up to council. If you have a recommendation to come back with a change to the resolution, you can give that or not. You guys, the public land strength trust fund. Okay. What, what's that? Yeah, we did before they started cars. Yeah, fifty percent or more. After, after this, after we do what we're doing, we're not changing that. Okay. All right. Yeah. You understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, well, let's you know, let's finish what we start, and then move into the, you know, change that. Okay. All right, moving to the next one. Yes, sir. Uh, you have a hard copy of the uh, interlocal agreement yes, between Bavard County and the City of Titusville. Um, there's an amendment uh, to that document with the uh, expiration of the the agreement ending on October 31st, 2021. So the amended uh, document now goes to April 1st, 2025. And I, I need a motion saying that you authorize the mayor to sign this interlocal agreement and we'll get it back to the county before the expiration 
that is now scheduled for the 31st. Any cards on that? Stan Johnston. You're not making any friends tonight. <laughs> uh, I uh, object to this uh, uh, septic tank thing. This is this. If you remember this project, we had a number of people speak against it already, and uh, they're not here. In other words, this this was announced just now. Now the people affected include Laura Ward. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to share this project with you. Mr. Stoffers here, but it's less than 20 homes over a million dollars. This is what I would call this, this type of sewage system that was proposed when I heard about it was an exotic system, very expensive, high maintenance, replacing septic tank systems that were working. In other words, Mrs. Ward, she just put in a whole bunch of money. I'm asking you to table this thing. I don't know what you can do, but he, he brought it up in the long, uh, at, at the last minute. That's not right. I, I, I'm asking you to table it. Whatever you can do, just table the thing, because the people that, that should be represented here, they don't know about it. And uh, it's, it's a bad idea. As an engineer, I, wouldn't, I would disapprove it. I'm, I'm, I've been surrounded with septic tanks for all my life. And, uh, and I've seen them working very well. In other words, for example, when I moved here in Titusville on Bell Terrace, we had a septic tank and a, 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 a well. Septic tank and a well on a lot that was like 100 foot by 100 foot. And now we're saying the septic tank is, is destroying the river. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked on septic tanks, drain fields, and so forth like that. And it, it's just nonsense to say that it's so dangerous and stuff that we have to, that it's causing the degradation of the river. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it. In, in, uh, in many cases, and, and, and these, these safety tanks, we got all kinds of requirements to make them sure that they're working. So I want it to be tabled, and I think you should table it. You probably won't listen to me, though. But uh, uh, it should have never gotten this position where, where, the, where Mrs. Ward and these other people who are concerned it's going to hurt him, they should be here uh, represented. And we should even have an engineer talk about how wonderful this system is going to be. It's an exotic system. It's not gravity. Thank you. Well, that's a surprise. Okay. Um, we need a, uh, any other cards? Yes, sir. And so we need a vote and a motion on that. Yes, sir. And it's to authorize the mayor to sign the interlocal agreement extension. Great. So moved, sir. I have a motion from Member Jordan. Second. Second from Vice Mayor. Roll call vote. Member Robinson. Oops. B. <laughs> <laughs> Member Robinson. <laughs> yes, on the agreement. Uh, Member Jordan. Yes. Mayor Diesel. Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson. Yes. Member Stokel. Yes. Passes unanimously. City Manager, guide us on. Uh, yes, sir. You are two petitions and requests from the public, non agenda items. May I? I know it's. Wait. Oh, go ahead. My problem can't wait another two weeks. Tony Shapolo, 715 Tropic Street. This is about the communication tower at the Florida Power and Light um, at the 900 block of Tropic Street. A year ago um, in July, I contacted, I'm taking a lesson from Dwight Seavers. I contacted city staff about the noise, the electronic noise that the tower started emitting. And it took until August, I got no help from staff. Oh, we can't do anything about it. It's not our problem, uh, blah, blah, blah. Finally, I got in touch with Mr. Thomas or Thompson, the city citizen advocate. He gave me a phone number for corporate. And I tracked down the people to get, to get the noise stopped from the tower. It's a bird thing. It doesn't do anything for the birds. I have photographs, I have video of the tower going off with its electronic noise every 19 to 22 minutes for over 35 seconds. 
Electronic noises that start with the beep, 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 and end with wee, 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 with a number of sounds in between for 30 to 35 seconds. It does not make the birds leave at all. I have video of the tower going off, the birds sitting there. All it does is aggravate the neighbors within a large radius. It goes 24 hours a day, has been going since the beginning of last week. I was up at one o'clock in the morning feeding my cat. I heard the noise. I timed it for a while. I discovered that it's every 19 to 22 minutes. I want it to stop. I'm not the only one who wants it to stop. A lot of my neighbors in the vicinity of the tower want it to stop. It's not doing any good for the birds. I fortunately kept the phone numbers. I'm in the process of calling again, but it was sure would be nice to have some help from the city. Mr. Larice, are you paying attention? Thank you, um, because you are the top of the city staff. And I just think they shouldn't be allowed to infringe on the neighbors and on the city and on the environment because it's not doing what it's designed to do, which is make the birds leave the tower. They sit there. They tolerate it. What did you find out last time? Pardon? What did you find out last time? You said The last time I got in touch with a couple of people. But did they stop it? They stopped it. It stopped. And it started it again. It stopped from last August of 2020, and it started again um, a couple of weeks Keep ago. You posted. I'm interested. I, I, it makes no sense. I it doesn't make, said. if it worked for the birds, if the birds would fly away when the sound started, well, it would be different. Especially since it happened once before. All right. Thank you. So thank you for letting me take your time. All right. Next. Reset. Reset. Nathan Slusher at 860 Allendale. I just want to follow up with you on the Marine Resource Council. Hey. I want to know if we can test the water to see if the acid has made it to the lagoon. When I did ask that question, uh, they basically said you can test anything you want, but they they didn't give me any examples or anything like that. They said you have to go to, uh, it's not something we can just, I don't know, you guys may be able to tell me, but they said you'd have to go to a higher level university or something like that. And, and again, since we're not able to do it and not doing it, and again, you can give an explanation on that if you want because it's beyond my pay grade except when I got a chance to talk to, I think he was from UCF. Um, he was the, the first speaker of the first day. And um, I said, I have a question. Only because I had it on my phone did I remember it. And um, he said, well, I get, and he was kind of like, I guess you can test anything. And he wasn't quite sure what we were looking for. And I, and I wasn't either. So uh, I don't have a real good answer for you. But I would say, let me see if I can't get that guy's name off of my program. And if nothing else, he would be a guy you could go through at UCF to find out whatever it is you want to find out. But it didn't sound like uh, it was something they did very often. Um, and <laughs> Personally, I don't think anyone, my personal opinion is I don't think we are testing for it. Anybody. I just don't think it's on the forefront of anybody's yeah. mind. Well, and that's why he said you could test anything you want, meaning that he kind of thought I was out in left field. You know, I guess you can test anything you want. He said, but it's not, not common practice. My, my thought process is you would test it, the water, just like you would chlorine in a pool. You have a little test kit, put some drops in, it would and seem, test it. It would seem. He didn't seem that interested. Uh, I'm just being very honest about it. He just, you know, you can test anything you want was the answer. And uh, he said, but it's not common practice. And I don't think he understood, and I couldn't tell him why. Why were we tested? So I was, I was out of my league. So if you can pursue that, let me know. Well, thank you for asking. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, he kind of kept walking after that. <laughs> but anyway, again, he, he did say we could test anything we wanted. He said, but it wasn't common practice. And he said, why would, why would you want to test that? And I really didn't know. I didn't. I, I think I forgot whatever it was you said. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess we go mayor's report, council report. Yeah, well, we I ain't saying you for nothing. Your report, man. I ain't saying nothing to you guys. <laughs> you would run me out of here if I did. Uh, I'm sure council has nothing to report either. Nothing. nothing. I'll wait till next meeting, guys. That yeah. we, thank you, <laughs> city manager. Uh, no, no, nothing to report. Uh, I believe the city attorney has one additional. City attorney. It's just for information, is the LIBOR green um, interest rate litigation that we filed a claim in for some financial notes from 2009, and we'll monitor that claim. Thank you very much. Anything else? Yeah. Willie? <laughs> meeting, meeting dismissed.